I also see on the list a few new people that I haven't seen previously. So welcome to those as well, to the planning meeting. And for those of you who are new to this, this is the, uh, the meeting where we really talk about what we're going to be talk about talking about at the FPO spring meeting or then at the fall meeting. And we're really paying mostly attention to the spring meeting, but kind of looking ahead to the fall meeting too, depending on what topics arise, where would they be, uh, better fall in terms of uh, location and getting people to, uh, to the meeting, uh, et cetera. And given the current situation, with the ongoing pandemic, uh, it's unlikely that in the spring we will be able to get back in person. And so at our fall meeting a couple of weeks ago, we essentially decided that we will hold the spring meeting virtually again. And that opens obviously the possibility for people to participate from wherever they are because typically we would have held the spring meeting in Washington, D.C., which is clearly for the agency folks uh, much easier to, to participate, but for the others to travel. And having it virtual now uh, is, is uh, giving us more options, also in terms of uh, avoiding major conflicts. And so in D.C. in the spring, one of the major conflicts was always the cherry blossom, and you want to avoid that because, not because it's beautiful, you actually want to be there for that, but it's a lot of people and hotels are booked out and expensive for that matter. And so <clears throat> we, we need to figure out when do we want to hold the spring meeting and what you see here on the slide in the upper right uh, we started charting down a few potential conflicts that we want to stay away if there is any major relevant conference from the American Meteorological Society, like the ARAM conference, but that one is going to be in January, so that should be fine. AIAA, uh, the Aviation Forum will be in June, so that should be fine too, because we're looking probably at an April uh, time frame roughly it could be earlier march if needs be or it could be later in may if needs be but i think april will probably be a good good time frame uh at co uh, as you know a major uh, get togethers that we want to stay away auvsi uh, the vertical flight society if there's any cdm meetings that are significant uh I, uh, Tripoli or REDAC or what was the NCF again, Matt? You put that on the list there. That's the National Customer Forum. Oh, yeah. So uh, if there are any other major meetings that are floating around that we are not aware of, please let us know such that we can add that to the list and then we will go through those websites to look at announcements and then figure out when are these dates that would be possible in between? Uh, and since it's virtual, we can really use Monday through Friday because there is no travel involved. Uh, but if you have any meetings from uh, places that you uh, frequent and don't want to have a conflict there, please let us know now or later by email. That's That's possible too or put it in the chat if you think about it later as we go through the meeting. But is anything that comes to mind right now, please uh, uh, raise your hand or, or voice your opinion or put it in the chat room. And and Matthias, uh, you know, we're, we're a small enough group that uh, that I, I certainly have, I have zero problem with, uh, with, with asking people to, um, to um, uh, you know, pipe in, unmute yourself, pipe in. Gary Picodner's put something in chat. Thank you very much for that, Gary. The sun and fun in Florida. And Gary, we don't want you to miss that one. <laughs> yeah, not sure if they're having it this year. I was just trying, my computer's kind of weird. I was trying to pull up the actual dates for you, but that I know FAA, there's a lot of people who support that. I don't know how many are FPA attendees. But that's a pretty big event. 
uh, for safety forums and other things if if it goes off. Right. I also oh. see Nancy Mendoza on the call. Uh, Nancy, do you see anything from NASA's side that would fall in that spring time frame that might be important to stay away from? No, I mean, we're, we're knee deep in budget planning at that point, so we're not not a lot of other things going on. Um, I guess my thought, and I and excuse my ignorance, is kind of I think you're targeting not quite the technical, you know, conference type of things. But I think it be, would be helpful to say, okay, who's the audience we want to have and where would that audience be? The, this list here is pretty broad from the standards to the technicals. And I think maybe, maybe this meeting is an interface of the two. In, in some ways it is. We have stakeholders across the aviation industry from operators to the agencies uh, to the research side of the house. And it, the common theme is really aviation weather and how it impacts operations and so we discuss generally at those uh, FPA meetings a, a variety of topics and that uh, includes aspects of operational impacts to uh, needs and requirements to emerging weather capabilities uh, etc so it's, it's really a, a an exchange forum that you don't necessarily find at a technical conference that you would go to. And Matt, please chime in and, and elaborate more or expand upon and, the, and, and uh, I was going to say, I was going to say, Matthias, I thought that was a, a great explanation. And Nancy, um, uh, you know, we 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 cover the gamut. So basically, anybody who uses, produces, regulates. Uh, researches, uh, aviation weather or aviation weather products um, is invited and and, uh, and with open arms to to FPA and and therefore our our list is a big one that we're trying to as best we can uh, avoid overlapping with. No, then I would just add Gamma would be the only one I would think of. Is it you know hit the o, is the OEMs since you want them there. And and is there is is um, uh, I mean I, I I know what gamma is. Is there an annual? Is it like an annual meeting? Is it a, what what is it that we would want to avoid? Uh oh. Fancy I'm just find just finding that mute button. I um I guess they've got a couple. They have two listed on their web. They have two other or events sponsored by others on their website. I don't know if they have any annual meetings where they get the OEMs together to talk about things. I would think they might, but yeah, I guess you're. I think you're right. Everybody's virtual this spring. Um, Matthias, um, if 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 I may uh, do a, a ninety degree turn here, it, it strikes me that since we are a fairly compact group, and and like you, I see some new names, which which just makes me, uh, you know, very happy to see names that I don't know because I've been around long enough that I know pretty much everybody who uh, normally comes to our meetings. I, I, I'd like to know who some of these folks are. Are you okay if we just go around the room very quickly and do a quick intro? Sure, absolutely. Okay, I um, because virtual intros can be kind of tricky if you say, okay, people just introduce yourself. I'm gonna actually conduct this uh, based on the participants list that I'm looking at. And since I'm on top, I will say, hi, I'm Matt Franzak from the MITRE Corporation. I'm an FPA co-chair and I've been around longer than dirt. Bruce? Oh, good morning. <clears throat> I'm Bruce Carmichael. I'm uh, retired from my uh, car and I've been uh, around even longer than Matt Franzak dirt. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I always look forward to uh, seeing who who gets together with us uh, on these planning meetings. Yeah, and and for those who don't know, Bruce was, for all intents and purposes, the the father, the grandfather, and the great grandfather of FPA, and uh, and he's he's still a part of our merry little band. So, Bruce, thank you for for coming back and 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 and, and gracing us with your presence again. Colleen. Uh, 
Whoa, sorry, I wasn't ready for that. I had to find my mute button going so early. Um, I'm Colleen Reiki. I'm a lead scientist with Quantitative Scientific Solutions, or QS2. Um, I have been around for, I guess, the past 10 years or so, which is kind of crazy to say, but great to, uh, to meet all the new folks and see everybody that I already know. Thanks, Matt. Yes, ma'am. And, and for those who don't know Colleen, um, uh, prior life, um, she was at AvMed Applications doing some really neat um, aviation weather work with, uh, uh, with Sadeg and, and Mike Robinson when he was there and, and the, the, the great folks they have working at AvMed. Uh, Debbie Kovalevsky, who, uh, who, who holds a, a dear spot in my heart based on one of my past lives. Hey, good morning, Matt. Uh, Debbie Kovalevsky, I am the secretary with the Airline Dispatchers Federation. Uh, I've been in dispatch. I'm at dispatch at United Airlines for, uh, oh gosh, about uh, 24 years now, uh, but uh, relatively new to my secretary position at the uh, ADF. Thank you, Debbie. And, uh, and for, for me personally, and, I, and I'm, I'm sure for Matthias and Bruce and others, we we do appreciate um, seeing uh, ADF represented at the meetings here. So thank you for being here today. And another another hook into my past life is is Matt. Ek and you know, Matt, I always I always say to myself now, is it Eckstein or Eckstein? And I always pick the wrong one. So I'm just going to say Matt, uh, who is at Delta Airlines, and I but I'll let you fill in the rest. Where today, if I was still working there, today would be my 46th anniversary at Delta Airlines. Go ahead, Matt. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, Matt X. I'm not sensitive about the pronunciation, so don't just don't worry about that and, and shoot from the hip. Um, uh, technical pilot and I guess what you would call the product manager for an in-house weather application that the pilots use for um, near real-time weather in flight. We call it flight weather viewer. Been working on that for about three years, and then I also work uh, to improve in-flight connectivity. Glad to be able to learn from all of you. And Matt, uh, again, for, for me personally and for Matthias, so very glad you're here. Thank you. Uh, Thomas Huff, I don't know that I know you, and or if I do, I'm having a, a brain lapse. Welcome. I see you unmuted. So we'll come back to 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 Thomas Huff, who appears to be having audio difficulties. How about Janet Ford? I'm not, again a new name for me, and and welcome. Um, thank you. Um, I'm glad to be here. Um, again, my name is Janet Ford. I'm actually a former, um, well, retired um, FAA. Um, I was in the flight service um, station option way back, way back in the, in the day. Um, right now, I am working with Capital Group, um, and we are contractors with the FAA, and we're currently working on um, a stakeholder engagement um, project that um, specifically addresses uh, pilots and um, pilot weather briefings and, and actually in aviation weather. So, thank you. Very good, Janet, welcome. And I remember seeing your name at the FPAW meeting and, and, uh, and uh, we, we, we had just too many on to go through and do something like this. So I'm glad we had an opportunity to, to learn about where you're coming from, what your background is and who you're working for now, welcome. Thank you. Jim, uh, and I'm going to take a stab at it, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Jim Haseman. Yeah, um, thanks, Matt. Um, Jim Haseman, and uh, I work with uh, Janet, the capital group, and um, we've been part of FPAW. We started coming about two years ago, and uh, that's about the time we started our stakeholder engagement project, which is really focused around changing pilot behavior um, regarding self-briefings. We have found the, the content of FPAW very helpful um, in, in our projects because what we're looking at is, is really, um, you know, we recognize that pilots do a lot of self-briefing today, but you know there's still a lot to call. And the FAA has always been kind of 
very um, nebulous or a little confusing at times about what, what their true message is around using automated um, products. You know, are they okay? Is it legal? Things like that. A lot of confusion, a lot of, um, you know, terms that weren't really official. So we undertook a project to really kind of address that uh, and, and kind of hit you know, many, uh, many of the, the, the confusing areas around what is the message, you know, defining the message, then making that message consistent throughout FAA documents, websites, and publications, and then also, um, you know, focusing on addressing the pilot, you know, weather gap, the knowledge gap, so, you know, filling in content there, um, looking at policies that the FAA uses and how they deliver um, weather briefings and whether they could be enhanced to, you know, uh, take advantage of automation for the specialists themselves. And then all look, also looking at data and um, you know analytics on who who uses flight service and who uses online and what maybe obstacles might exist. So that that's kind of a background of our project. Um, the reason I think Jan and I are here today is because we uh, have submitted um, you know a potential topic if if you're interested right for for a presentation in April um, around you know our, our project our effort what we found and how we're moving forward um, by. Uh, where we are right now is, uh, and you may have seen some of this, you know, we, we do have a very consistent message within the FAA around, you know, uh, online resources, and we're also in the process of developing and, and moving into production our first wings course for pilots uh, for how to, how to do a self briefing properly, how to, how to make it compliant. And, um, you know, I'll just point out again, a lot of some of the content, a lot of the content in that class has been derived from research that was presented at FPA. So, so that's why we're here. We, we're not, you know, normally in these planning me meetings, and we probably won't, you know, have a lot to say. But we can answer any questions you may have about our proposed topic that Janet has submitted. Excellent. Th thank you, Jim, uh, and thank you, Janet, and and welcome. And and even if this evolves over time to not have much to do with your projects you're still welcome back and and we 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 as always appreciate a a broad spectrum of input and and uh, you know i think you you can you can help us out in that area joe vickers hey how are you i'm a, a retired united airlines dispatch and, and um occ I'm also a uh, retired uh, Scientech. It's a consulting group for business processes of command and control and infrastructure. Currently, I'm working with a group called AST based in Chicago is Aviation Safety Technologies. They're developing or we're developing, uh, have developed, I should say, automated real time uh, aircraft braking action reports utilizing aircraft uh, downloaded during the uh, during the rollout. And we present that back to the uh, to the uh, industry. I attend this meeting just to um, keep abreast of uh, developments. And uh, thank you for having me. Very good, Joe. Um, and, and I had seen your name before. My recollection is that that you either presented or uh, contributed to a presentation um, a couple of two three meetings ago. Am I remembering that right? Yeah, I've given a couple of presentations to this group, and it was when I first started getting involved in the um, breaking action report project. Uh, we were kind of slowed down a little bit by the FAA, um, not through fault of their own, but it <laughs> turns out that uh, ours is a new technology. So when an airline or an airport says, hey, can we use it? Does the FAA approve it? The FAA would say, well, we don't have a standard to compare you against, so we can't approve or disapprove. It's up to the users to want to use it. Uh, so to get around that, we've been working with ASTM for the past three years to have that standard be published, and we're proud to say that it's that's that's going on right now. So uh, we're hoping to hit the market soon. Very good. Thank you, Joe. My brother John Kosak, if you still have your uh, one ear on this meeting, you're up. Hey, guys. John Kozak, NBAA uh, weather dude. So uh, just trying to keep one earbud in and uh, keep keep uh, an eye on uh, or an ear on Matt and Matthias. <laughs> because we need all the help we can get. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, Lee. Hello, uh, everybody. Uh, good morning. I'm Lee Chang from INSG. Uh, a science technology company based in Maryland. I started my career as a aviation weather meteorologist and uh, came to the United States uh, early 90s, uh, then worked for this company and after graduation. Uh, right now we are the, the prime contractor of uh, 
NSEP uh, Environmental Modeling Center. Our scientists are mostly working on the background, uh, on modeling uh, data simulation algorithms, uh, and uh, who support the, who also, you know, uh, support the operational uh, national numerical modeling uh, guidance needs. Okay, so we're, what we're particularly interested in the uh, FPAW community is really we like the uh, uh, operational aspect from ATM and from airlines and uh, also want to learn about the new challenges that, uh, you know, the operational uh, pilots or ATM encounter and some of the emerging new technologies. And uh, we're always very excited by those. Uh, understanding that will help us to uh, even tailor or bring enhanced or new solution to the uh, community. And uh, we did submit the uh, topic on airspace capacity estimation and hopefully uh, to discuss with you folks and uh, see whether there's a way to uh, bring in enhanced uh, decision support tools. Of course, not ignoring the, the human side, the communication coordination side of the uh, uh, entire matrix. Thank you. Very good, Lee. And, and for, the, for the folks who don't know uh, Lee very well, Lee was until this year when he cycled off a member of the uh, American Meteorological Society Aviation Range and Aerospace Meteorology Committee. And Colleen Reiki is a member of uh, that committee right now along with yours truly. So we, we've got a connection between the AMS work and the, and the FPAR work, which is a nice thing to have. My brother, Matt Wanderson. Hey, good morning, Matt Wanderson. I am at NOAA GSL and a group we do a lot of uh, aviation weather uh, verification for the FAA and the weather service and a bit of decision support as well. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. Good morning, Matthias. Okay, uh, I'm Matthias Steiner. I'm a senior scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in the Research Applications Laboratory. I uh, succeeded Bruce Carmichael as the director of the Aviation Applications Program, and in some ways, I succeeded him also as. <laughs> co-chair of the Friends and Partners in Aviation Weather. It was a package deal. <laughs> yeah, it's just, uh, Bruce, where are you going next? Maybe retirement is my next step. <laughs> so I plan to go to Cancun on the 7th of, uh, uh, 7th of November and spend a week on the beach. Okay, I actually have been there before you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there in the 90s, before Cancun was really, you know, the big thing to go to. Very good. Nancy, a welcome, and I've heard you speak, and now tell us a little bit about who you are. Um, so, Nancy Mendonca, I am the deputy at, um, at NASA for the newly created AAM mission, <clears throat> excuse me, mission integration office. So that's a deputy to, um, there's a real small office, but uh, Davis Hackenberg is the, the lead of that office for folks that have run across him. Um, background, Navy um, Hilo pilot, and primarily kind of focused in, in two areas uh, within the AAM, UAM, um, yeah, I guess, ecosystem. So we've, we've been talking about a weather ecosystem for that mode of, of flight and operations. So kind of cons making sure that, or trying to, that all the areas of the ecosystem are covered because we can't let one area be gapped and be successful in the end. Um, and the other focus is, is there's a lot of policy decisions that um, we will need to make to have AAM be viable, kind of like getting away from certifying sensors to certifying uh, weather data itself. So I'd like to make sure that the efforts that are going feed what the FAA needs to be able to make those policy shifts and decisions are kind of where I'm focusing. Very good. And Nancy, for those of us who are not as uh, entrenched as you are, can you decode AAM for us? <laughs> AAM is advanced air mobility. So in the ultimate state, think um, past, uh, urban and rural 
low, um, low, low altitude as in, you know, 6,000 feet and below passenger cargo transportation. Um, at, um, UTM, the smalls, would be eventually part of that. They might be two systems that work in parallel for a while. But, you know, kind of that, hey, I want to go from my house to work or, you know, and, or I want to go from my house to the airport by air. So it's kind of the, uh, the, the, the mashing together in a logical way of, of UAS and, and, um, and, and UAM and, and a variety of the other components into an overall larger ecosystem then, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, with it within the NAS, um, you know, as an inter, as an integral part of the, the overall system. So, but you know, a little few a uh, few differences. Third party service providers for for traffic for traffic management. Um, definitely, you know, weather weather da um, supplemental data service providers is a concept in there that um, we have you know borrowed from the NAS, but will hopefully be more fully fleshed out in AAM and things. Um, and to, I think it was Joe's comment on the braking, you know, pulling in that this is the safety and what we're calling um, ISSAs, in time system wide safety assurance capabilities. So, yeah, some, a lot of advances and things that we're envisioning in that ultimate system. Very good. Well, thank you, Nancy. Welcome. I uh, hope we see you here on a frequent basis since it seems like we are talking about the unmanned aviation weather airspace fairly frequently. Michael McPartland, I haven't talked to you in, a, in an age and a half. How are you doing? Unmute. Okay. I'm here. I'm here. I'm sorry. It wasn't me. It was Microsoft Windows. I apologize. That, that, that's okay. And I understand that fully. Go ahead, Mike. Um, hello, everyone. This is Michael from MIT Lincoln Laboratory. And uh, you probably know me mostly for being interested, active, and loving uh, aircraft sensing and, and uh, trying to deduce new methodologies for in-situ measurement to the atmosphere. A lot of our goals we're working on here is uh, using aircraft-based data and drone data to generate higher resolution, uh, more temporally and higher gridded forecasts to solve issues that we know exist in supplying the data necessary for uh, you know, um, AAM, UAM, whatever you want to call it, and small UAS operations that are forthcoming. That's our goal, that's our interests. Very good, thank you, Michael. Welcome, uh, Josh. Good morning, Matt and everyone. Uh, Josh Paris. I'm in airport operations at Minneapolis St. Paul uh, Airport. Um, it was good to see Joe Vickers on it. He was actually on one of my panels here a couple of years ago uh, with runway friction uh, from a few different angles. So good to see him. And actually, the ASTM subcommittee that he mentioned working on standards for his type of sensor, I'm a member of that small group as well. So we have been making progress and look forward to uh, to something to show for that from that side also. But uh, good to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. You know, Gary, when I when I look at your name, I don't know why, but you know that you, you know that um, that that beer commercial that, that features the most interesting man in the world. Somehow when I see Gary Picodner, I think the most interesting man in the world. Well, that's nice of you. That's an interesting <laughs> statement. I actually met a guy who we thought was that Years ago, when I was in Miami at a bar, he looked exactly <laughs> like the guy. Um, then we, my wife and I were sure we were talking to him. It wasn't, but he sure seemed like it. But I've never heard that one before. <laughs> so for those who don't know me, Gary Picodner, I'm uh, FAA program manager for the weather technology in the cockpit program. Um, actually been working uh, probably partly with Janet and Jim. Um, we've kicked off some research on self-briefings and how effective they are compared to having a specialist do it because of a lot of the issues we've seen in pilot knowledge. So we've been working closely with them as well as the VFR not recommended automation stuff. So I've been talking with uh, Jim and Janet a lot who you just met. And obviously um, 2035, which may be something I propose has become something WIDEX become involved with. And I know MITRE is certainly at the center of that work in the FAA. 
So I know, Matt, you're up on that. So that may be something I propose as we I hear what's coming up. Very good. Thank you, Gary. And Joe Vicker, did you mean to share? I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to pretend that that's no. And I'm going to go back and I'm that's gonna, correct. That's a no. <laughs> OK, very well. Then I am going to see your share and raise you another share. if I can remember how to do it. Where's your shared window? Heck, I don't know right here. Sorry, I'm I just I, I just I just completely croaked myself, but we'll we'll get back and figure this out in a second. Uh, Rhonda, also known as Swimbo. Anybody who wants to know what Swimbo means, you can ask me later. Yeah, I guess I forgot what that stood for too. <laughs> yeah, and it, it, it's it's a very it's a it's a highly sought after uh, title. <laughs> You'll have to tell me again. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, this is Rhonda. Um, I'm an admin with the, the RAL division. Um, I've been there for 27 years, um, and I support a couple of the programs within RAL and support the FPA meetings for probably the past 20 some years. So that's about it. And and for those who don't know, SWIMBO is an acronym. It's a SWMBO and it stands for She Who Must Be Obeyed. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Very good. Steve, welcome. A new name for me. Steve Arbogast. Yes, good morning all. Yeah, I've had the pleasure of attending a few of your meetings in the past few years. Um, I'm just uh, since I saw this online, I thought we'd uh, jump in again. I work with a company called Universal Weather and Aviation. I'm a meteorologist dispatcher there. I work closely with John Kosak every now and then and the MBA folks. Our main focus is international trip support and the international weather. We also do a lot of domestic flying. Our concerns are severe weather and mitigation of any delays that our clients may affect. Our clients are all corporate aviation folks. Very good, Steve, and, and glad to see, uh, you know, you from your uh, interesting end of the uh, uh, of the of the puzzle here. Uh, that's uh, that's really neat. And as a meteorologist dispatcher, um, I'm 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 immediately drawn to people like you. So, well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming back. Steve Dar. Good morning, Matt uh, and Matthias and, and all um, Steve Dar. Uh, happy to, to say another helicopter pilot. Uh, good to have Nancy with us uh, from that perspective while we're uh, affiliating. Um, and uh, I've been working uh, data link standards for aviation uh, weather information for a little over 10 years. And um, for those that weren't in the, the last FPA meeting a few weeks ago, um, I'm happy to report that the standards for ADSB version three uh, will have um, the ability to report uh, both uh, sensor-based uh, weather data and um, and PIREPS um, via the uh, the upcoming um, version three standard for ADSB. Very good. Thank you, Steve. Anne Marie, who who uh, who who gave such a nice um, uh, parting shot at the end of the FPA meeting when she left there, uh, welcome and uh, tell us a little bit about where you work within the FAA and what you do. So I am 29 years an air traffic controller. I worked in Farmingdale, Long Island, New York Tracon, Wiley Post, Oklahoma, Greensboro, North Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina, which. I spent most of my years, uh, probably about 16 years, then Potomac Tracon, and I hung my headset up in January because at 56, you can't work air traffic anymore, and I moved over to standards and procedures at headquarters. Oh. And uh, since I'm the newest one there and the most equipped with all the weather that we've had to deal with most of the years, um, we don't have anybody in there that really uh, is 
dealing with the weather, but we have to write procedures on it and policies and all that. So they asked if I would be the guru <laughs> and the one to uh, start attending some meetings and understanding. And um, so this is uh, FPA. I was on a meeting, I guess, maybe the last time, but last week or a couple weeks ago it was very, very interesting. I keep bringing it back to my group how so important this is because, I mean, controllers have to deal with this every day and policies and notums and all these things happening with the pilots and everything. They they really want to, to be involved. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> Very good. And Anne-Marie, pronounce your last name for me, please. It's Taggio. It's Italian. <laughs> Taggio. Okay. And you said standards and procedures. Is that in, is in, is that in, as in flight standards or is that in air traffic? It's air in... traffic. Mission support services at uh, the FAA headquarters. So AJV? AJVP, yeah. Ah, very good. Okay, now now I'm starting to, to make connections here. Yeah. That's good. That, that's always helpful to me. Yeah. Well, welcome, Anne Marie, and we we uh, we we very much look forward to your inputs. And it's um, I'm I'm grateful that there's an AJV rep that's 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 going to be hopefully with us for a period of time. So yeah, so. that that's that was their concern when I first got in, and since I was the last one from the boards and the closest to it, they felt I'd, I'd be okay in this uh, department, <laughs> dealing with the weather all my life, right? That's a, that's a, that's a very glass half full um, <laughs> um, uh, sort of, 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 of description and explanation you've given there. The glass half empty part of me would say, here's a weather, we, have a, we, we needed somebody to go to the weather. Who's the junior person? Oh, Anne-Marie, you get the weather stuff. <laughs> yeah, so, well, very thank good. you. Well, welcome. Tom Ryan. Morning, everybody. So I uh, am a retired FAA person. I had the honor of working both in next gen weather and also flight standards weather and uh, just absolutely love the community, certainly love the work and uh, can sense the benefits of it. And so after I retired, I asked around and, and I was picked up by a small company many of you know called AvMet. And I get to serve, presently, I get to serve the uh, Flight Standards Brothers that I worked with before. So, Anne-Marie, welcome. We really want to connect with you guys. And uh, anyway, I've loved FPAW since I think my first year was 2007 when I had a tiny little program called NNEW. And <laughs> called something else now. Thank you very much. Oh, Lord. We could go on and on and on, couldn't we? Uh, one one yeah, of my favorite that we want to be pleasant. Sorry, that's right. <laughs> my favorite people in the entire world. My my very very good friend Warren Qualley. Welcome. Oh, thank you, Matt. And uh, likewise. Uh, so I've been involved with this. I guess charter member Bruce. Go back when uh, you guys first started this venture in the late '90s. And um, even though I am recently unemployed as a result of a voluntary departure from Southwest Airlines at the end of September, I find that I'm having trouble uh, pulling away from FPA and things like that. Uh, there's this, this group has been um, inspirational. It, uh, it has uh, brought together a lot of really interesting folks who I've really enjoyed working with. And so not uh, not really ready to go out to pasture yet. I decided I will still keep involved in things such as FPA and see where things lead. Leave it at that. Very good. And for those who don't know Warren, uh, dial me up after the meeting and, and I'll fill you in all the gory details. <laughs> so uh, Warren is also the um, official historian of FPA. That's right, and and uh, we cannot let him go from from that uh, from that position. Otherwise, we lose sight of where we've been and what we've done. Well, and Matt, one more thing, I, I will add for those uh, <laughs> who uh, that don't know me, um, I've been in commercial aviation weather for my pretty much my entire career since 1978. Uh, I spent 25 years at American Airlines. And I worked a couple places in between uh, after my departure there uh, and before I started with Southwest Airlines four and a half years ago. 
uh, managing the weather department uh, at American and uh, likewise at Southwest Airlines uh, in the Dallas Fort Worth area here. Yep. And and Warren, um, speaking of, of AMS and ARAM, Warren is one of those very rare, almost hen's teeth kind of of uh, of a, a fellows of the American Meteorological Society, and I use fellows with a capital F. Um, uh, Warren is a fellow, and and yet he does not have PhD after his name, nor has he published scads of peer reviewed papers. And so uh, th that's that's a way of saying that Warren has done other stuff that have been recognized and, and led to him being named a, a fellow of the AMS. So as always, Warren, nice to hear from you, to have you with us. Thanks. Uh, and, and I'm going to take a stab at it here. Wenzi Yang? Yang? And I see you're unmuted, but hear nothing. Probably Microsoft. <laughs> and I'm sorry, Wenzi, but we hear a th I I don't hear you. Okay, is there anybody else who I have missed? Uh, or oh, Rhonda Moore has her hand up, so I I think I should I should certainly defer to Swimbo, Rhonda. <sighs> Yes, I had uh, wanted to see if I could get Warren Qualley to send me his new email address because the stuff that I've been sending is coming back. And it's funny you mentioned that this this adult brain um, has <laughs> I, I was just mentioned to my wife and that within the last hour, wondering if it was because of the change of uh, uh, status from working to non-working or simply age or a combination thereof. I've been meaning to do that, Rhonda, so I will do that here momentarily. Thank, Thank you. For the you. Reminder. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, uh, so we've gone through the list, and and I apologize for hijacking our meeting, Matthias, but I do so love hearing from people and hearing what they're working on and and you know what their perspectives are because I'm I'm as everybody knows I, I think it's so important to understand context. Hi, hi, Matt. Uh, this is Lee again. Uh, just a quick addition. Since ahead, uh, Win, uh, Dr. Winter Young can talk. Uh, he is uh, another scientist of INSG. He participated uh, uh, at four meetings uh, these years, and just recently uh, just published a paper on uh, Journal of Air Transportation on Airspace Estimation. Just ah. to keep, keep update. Thank you. That, thank you, Lee, for connecting that dot. That helps. I appreciate that. And then there was one. There was one other of our guests. I think it was Thomas Huff. Who? Uh, here we go. I hear him now. Go ahead. Matt, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I'm doing the same thing John's doing and trying to multitask. <laughs> um, Are you doing it for NBAA too? I am the former chairman of the safety committee for NBAA. Uh -huh. Also the uh, chief of safety for uh, Gulfstream. And obviously, weather is a prominent uh, hazard. So, uh, Judy Reif was kind enough to afford me to FPA and appreciate the opportunity to uh, learn and, and listen in. And and do you go by Thomas or Tom? Either one. Tom is preferred. Okay, Tom. Thank you. Welcome. And uh, and yes, those of us who have been uh, in, involved in this long enough also consider, unfortunately, weather to be either a or the primary safety factor and uh, and um, you know certainly something that we've we've collectively gone a long ways toward resolving but still have a long ways to go okay i'm going to shut up now finally thank goodness they're saying and matthias hand it back over to you because i've hijacked the first 45 minutes of our meeting to do this go ahead no i like what you did matt because it's small enough group and if we would have been in person during breaks, we would have had the opportunity to chat with each other. And in virtual space, this is uh, more difficult to accomplish. And so this was a good way of introducing each other, especially since we have quite a few new uh, people on, on the call here. So that was great. Thank you, Matt, for doing so. Uh, let's see, where were we leaving off? I think we talked about the spring meeting and potential conflicts we have to look at up 
we have certainly a list there of uh, groups and events that we need to check on what's going on and then we will come up with a you know few select options for the spring meeting and we'll distribute that to the larger fpa email group and if you are on this call and you haven't actually uh, subscribed to membership on the FPA, please go on the website and uh, become a member of the Friends and Partners. It doesn't cost anything, so you uh, really can subscribe and become uh, a member and through that uh, stay informed what's going on and, and Matt is just typing down the web link there. Uh, so if you are not on the list yet, please do so, which is the way to get in, stay informed about what's going on, about future meetings, etc. Uh, and, and, and Matthias, if I may add to uh, to what you just said about these, you know, these these other major meetings that we're trying to avoid. One of the things that occurred to Matthias and I as we were speaking uh, about this prior to today's meeting is that is that to the best of my knowledge, all of us have to go around to all of these these locations, these websites, and 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 uh, pull these these uh, specific dates out, um, provided that uh, that our 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 vast and crack staff of of um, of of FPA personnel, which means Matt and Matthias and Rhonda, can figure out a way to squeeze us in. What we might do is try to set up a calendar that lists these. So that maybe it's a one-stop aviation weather shop for you to go and look and see where these meetings are happening and you know when they're planned to, to be there. Now, now given again our our munificent um, pay scales and and whatnot, it may not be always completely current, but it, it, it would at least be a, a first <laughs> a, a, a first order glance value. Uh oh, there's a, a supposed to be a meeting this week. Maybe I should go look up something or or see what's going on. And to be specific about that, Matt, if you look on the website that you just typed in, there is a tab resources and it will probably fall under that. There's already some things there and we may expand as as we dig through that and, and find out uh, about relevant meetings, etc. So I think it will probably go there. OK, back to the fall meeting next year. We talked a while about that, that the spring meetings tended to be in Washington, D.C. for reasons we explained before, because of the agency's headquarters sitting there. And then the fall meeting has been for quite a long time moving uh, with NBAA with their uh, BACE meetings and was sort of going back and forth between Las Vegas and uh, Orlando. And a few meetings ago, this became more open. And so the plan was actually that the fall meeting was held in Boulder, which obviously didn't happen because of the pandemic situation and we had to go virtual. And at that point, we already knew that the 21 fall meeting, uh, NSSL, uh, Heather Reeves has volunteered to hold it in Norman, Oklahoma. And so for right now, this is still on the docket as such to be uh, later in October or early November for next year. But we'll have to see how it plays out because of if the pandemic situation is still a concern at that time, then obviously the university facilities would have priority to accommodate their students. And if they would have to spread out, they would obviously need the larger rooms for, for their classes. And so we'll have to see how it play, plays out. And so stay tuned about that. But nonetheless, we can still look ahead for the fall meeting. What would be potential topics for that? But before we start digging into the topics here, I want to touch base briefly on some general meeting format issues. We have done now the spring meeting and we have done the fall meeting virtual. So we have gained a little bit of experience in doing that and what works well and what maybe we, we have room for improvement. 
So uh, you see a few, a few bullets there. Uh, depending on how many topics we line up and uh, how many topics we have for that matter or how much space they need, we are thinking like two or three days uh, in virtual form would certainly work, but we would probably keep it reduced to maybe four or five hours each day and accommodate four time zones from the East Coast all the way out to Alaska. And that I think has worked pretty well in the past. We also have leaned towards keeping one primary topic per day to use up you know, the, the majority of, of the time, plus have maybe an hour with smaller updates of ongoing topics where we don't really need to uh, dig in deeper and have a broader perspective. It's more informal uh, updates, uh, information updates as to what's going on. And so as we go through the topics, uh, thinking about the future meetings, think also whether what you're suggesting or what's on the list, whether this is really a major topic that requires fleshing out, uh, you know, shedding light from different perspectives on it, or whether this is more an informational uh, segment that is is uh, here is the update on what's going on or here is what's going on and we would like to hear feedback from you uh, etc which could be you know uh, uh, packed into a smaller uh, time segments and also what we keep hearing is we need more breaks in between and also more substantial breaks obviously the thing is we are just too excited about what Going on and, keep <laughs> and uh, so uh, you know nature calls uh, once in a while and so yeah we need to make sure we build in breaks of minimum maybe 10-15 uh, minutes and maybe 20 to 30 minutes as a more substantial break so uh, Matt and I with the session organizers will uh, try to keep an eye on that and also as we run through the meetings we will try to uh, enforce that or encourage it or i don't know <laughs> the right to see it. it's it's it, it's an interesting problem because um i'm i i, I find myself motivated meetings these virtual meetings as short as we can keep them um and, and people have chimed in and said yay verily if you do it you know, between these hours, I can get stuff done before and after. It doesn't croak my entire day. And at the same time, yeah, uh, we, we, we need to get up out of our chairs and move around a little bit and, and use the facilities and stuff like that. So it's just an interesting, it's an interesting balance that, that you try to strike. And, and so, somehow this four, four and a half-ish, four and three quarters, whatever hours per day, to, to me, feels like a nice sweet spot for us when we're doing these meetings completely virtually. Uh, once we go back to in-person, of course, then then the time of the in-person meeting, um, you know, drives the the meeting agenda basically, and and um, um, the virtual meeting will then hopefully, and and I well, I I personally feel like I've heard this loudly and clearly from any number of people that will probably always try to have a way to make the meeting available virtually because enough people have said this is really important to us that I, that I think we'll try to do so and 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 but, but the meeting times at that point will will be will will follow along with the in-person meetings of course all righty i'm showing uh just a few seconds past 10 past noon um is that a real background, Matthias? Yes. Uh, my wife, Mary, and I are both on telcons and we are interfering, so I had to look for another spot. And when I went to the bedroom, the, the connection dropped, so I'm sitting outside with 35 degrees. <laughs> it's a good thing you're a hardy kind of guy. Uh, anyway. <laughs> You see, I do that even on vacation. <laughs> yes, yes. 
So, uh, so Matthias, I, I skipped ahead to the to the next slide, which I presume we'd want to talk about, and I did some blowing up of it so that people could see it maybe more easily. So, um, um, right. What I was thinking is going through this slide just from a high level perspective, in terms of these are sort of general topics that have come up over time, and then go through the next two slides in terms of what were recent topics that were submitted and what were topics mm -hmm. from oh gee do you still hear me yes i think i lost the connection you still here yeah i hear you matthias yes. okay well it looks like the connection is very thin i just got dropped here so in the worst case you may have to take over matt if if i'm you know getting offline here or I have to go back interfering with with Mary, I guess. <laughs> but she has a, a private conversation with a student and parent, and so I, I need to make sure she can have that. Understand. OK, so. Anyway. OK, so so would would you like me to at this point do my best at uh, at uh, um, going through this and then you could you could chime in? How do you want to work this? Uh, it might possibly be safer if if you will go ahead and run through the slides and and the topics and shepherd the discussion because I cannot guarantee I stay connected. OK, all right. Well, I will do my best. Um, but but uh, but do, do keep in mind that I was counting on you to do this, so I'm going to be I'm going to be this is going to be completely winging it, but I, I'm Lord knows I'm a dispatcher. I'm used to winging stuff. OK, so um, so we, we've we've looked at um, uh, or I should I should probably more appropriately say that Matthias has looked at the um, uh, the past FPA meetings and and at um, uh, topics that have that have um, come up and been discussed throughout and and found that we uh, can or or, sh or th that we can bucket them into these um, kind of six categories that that Matthias has here. There may be more. I don't think that this is necessarily a a, a uh, exhaustive list but it was something that we looked at and 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 it it did seem to um uh to to um bubble up to the top here those those six topics being um emerging modes of transportation so the aam stuff that nandy mendonca mendonca was uh talking about earlier uh, also the supersonic flight and the very high altitude um uh, operations that are being not only conceived but actually conducted nowadays. Um, weather integration, uh, and and we we probably should should uh, should consider putting in here weather forecasts, um, since we do have uh, weather observations as another category directly beneath it. Um, but uh, weather integration into both um, uh, ATM tools, ATM processes, ATM decision making, uh, decision making under uncertainty, certainly a, a an interesting topic and one that um, at, at the FPA meeting two weeks ago uh, came up for some uh, some interesting um, limited but interesting discussion that uh, that Matt Eckstein was involved with uh, about probabilistic versus deterministic um, weather products and and um, and uh, the intersection of those two spaces. Um, how to how to characterize uh, the uncertainty of both weather and traffic, and then the human factors and automation aspects uh, uh, along with that. So that that weather integration topic is actually um, a very broad one and and one that we find ourselves dipping into fairly frequently. I would say, uh, Walter Combs um, had. Um, uh, an interesting update on the on the VWAS system. Steve Dar had interesting updates uh, on the uh, the aircraft um, ADS weather type of uh, of in situ observations. Um, we we find ourselves uh, again and again going back to this area and talking about things like like PIREPS, like um, uh, augmenting surface observations, human augmentation, or in the case of of some of the stuff that the FAA's Aviation Weather Division is working on some of the 
uh, of the updates to, for instance, the winter weather sensors that are being uh, are being worked and hopefully will be uh, will be rolled out in the next few years as part of our ASOS and AWOS systems. Uh, weather in the cockpit. We we have Gary Picodner on the line. Uh, th this is his this is his uh, area of expertise and interest, and uh, it continues to to be an important topic. I think for us and 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 one that that we should not lose sight of from the perspective of of of, of the aviation weather user community. And and uh, and certainly, you know, we can we can have the greatest ideas in the world um, about about how this, how the weather in the cockpit maybe should look, how it should behave, what its latency should be, all those sorts of things. But at the end of the day, we need to hear back from the users, the the, the pilots who are taking this information and 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 making decisions based on it, uh, as far as what works and and what doesn't work. And and I I personally think that that th this is, if not the, maybe one of the most important roles that FPAW plays, that is to, to give the users of aviation weather information um, a voice, and, 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 and not just FAA users of weather information, but the, but the entire broad community. Um, something that, 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 um, um, that, that I, have, I have a hard time wrapping my head around this, but clearly I need to do a better job of, of understanding what the impacts of our uh, evolving climate are on, um, on, on the aviation ecosystem itself, on the, on, on the aviation um, uh, infrastructure. And, and so what do increasing temperatures, what does increasing sea level, um, uh, how, how do the, the, you know, the, what is likely to happen with regards to severe weather or uh, or or turbulence or lightning and 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 how 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 should we most appropriately not only react to but hopefully plan for these sorts of 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 changes and then we get into this kind of large bucket that uh, Matthias has labeled general updates where we're looking to to find out what the labs um, are working on so so we heard from from Joe Vickers we heard from um, Mr. Hazeman we heard from Janet Ford we heard from Michael McPartland about the R and D kinds of activities that that uh, that they are working on uh, we've got somebody uh, um, not here today because of the um, of the uh, SPRM. A meeting conflict, but uh, we've got a, a lot of, of flight standards interest in uh, in the FPAW work, and and we 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 always hear from Gordy Rother and John Steventon and Marilyn Pearson um, what's going on on the regulatory policy and procedure side within the FAA, um, the weather community of interest, the the FAA's um, kind of if you will version internal version of the FPAW that brings together all of their user uh, or, or, or aviation weather constituents or users or, or regulators in, in one forum. Uh, you know, we, we, we believe that we need to be linked either informally or if it's appropriate formally, and that is still to be determined with the weather COI and, and, and hearing their, their updates as, as they go forward and then, you know, trying to determine the best way that we can um, react to or inform them um, in the future, and then, then the old uh, constant bugaboo that, that that we all have to deal with, and that's that's funding. And and I'm I'm reminded um, as we talk about aviation weather funding of um, of of how at least um, um, with some folks in my organization at MITRE, uh, especially those that are working on on um, um, new engineering type projects for systems in which weather should, is a consideration or, or arguably should be should be tightly integrated. Um, there's a there's this there's often this reaction of well, you know, this is going to be a hard enough engineering project, a, a hard enough system development project on its own, and if we introduce weather right up front. It's going to make it even doubly more difficult. So you know what? We're going to we're going to build it 
um, and 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 make sure it can be used when the weather is nominal. And when I hear when the weather is nominal, I come unglued because uh, nominal weather is like the stuff that's going on where Matthias is right now, or where I am right now, or what's going to be happening in Louisiana later on. So. So one of the one of the things that we need to do, and 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 this is often reflected in the funding challenges, is is to convince people that weather is nominal. And so I, I show you my little button of which I've made 50 or so, and have them available for when we get back together, and we'll be handing them out. Because, ladies and gentlemen, weather is nominal. Bluebird weather is non-nominal or off-nominal. I think we need to try to convince people of this going forward. Anyhow. I'll, I'll stop there and and open it up to to anybody that that would like to make a comment or that uh, that perhaps says I, I think you all are out of your minds or whatever the case may be. There were some comments in the chat room. Matt uh, Matt Eckstein was uh, saying that maybe a subtopic to weather integration would be data standardization and it's difficult to build actionable guidance on top of myriad non-standardized weather data sets. Okay, let me see if I can slide this in here without... Uh... If only I could type. Okay, if I do it that way, Matthias, and I'll 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 make it where it all fits here, in just sure. And and I don't know if Matt want to elaborate on that, uh, but I can also see that this is part of the discussion with uh, low-level operations off airports for helicopters and uh, urban air mobility or uh, UAS operators because there's not much weather guidance there and you would have to think in terms of what other information can you pull in from maybe non-standard sources that are not AWOS or ASOS based that may be RVIS based or maybe coming in from other sources from hobby meteorologists it may include uh, synthesized information from uh, uh, model and uh, combined to try to provide guidance for operations at low levels. I mean, ASTM, uh, the standards body group uh, F38 is working on that uh, right now. There's a small group that I saw Marilyn Pearson uh, was uh, joining us too this morning. She is part of that, among others, uh, Colleen Reiki too, myself, uh, etc. So we are talking about those things. And so I could definitely see that this would make an attractive topic for, for one of the sessions to provide an update on what's coming out from that end. Okay. Very good. Anybody else want to chime in on this? I, 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 uh, Matt Eckstein or or Marilyn, anything to add? Hi, Matt. I just put something in the chat for you. Thank you. I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to be like John Kosak and multitask, which means I'm not worth a hoot. That's okay. I'm on a Zoom meeting while I'm on this one too. I know. Uh, <laughs> It's difficult. Um, so I guess it's it's a catch-22. Um, the regulators can't develop policy and standards unless we have something dependable and verifiable and accurate. So um, what I hear from operators and petitioners is that they're not willing to go out on a limb and spend money on systems if those systems aren't going to be approved for use. Yeah, I can see without getting into the details here on, on how we go about this, but that this could clearly be an interesting uh, discussion topic to have where we bring in regulators, uh, the research community, operators uh, to, to talk about this. What are the pros and cons of this approach and how do you go about coming up with something that everybody buys in? You know, Matthias, one of the things we had hoped uh, 
from a regulatory perspective is that when the IPP began, that we would have these various uh, operators looking at weather and doing tests using various uh, sensor systems and what have you, and that we would learn from that. We would collect the data from those operators. Um, unfortunately, that didn't quite happen, but that's not to say that perhaps there's some area where we could define uh, a test area to allow operators to use specific model sensors, VWAS, whatever systems there might be to collect data and prove um, accuracy. Yep, and, and also uh, chiming in in the chat room, she was talking about enabling multiple uses of weather data by both aviation and non-aviation stakeholders, essentially looking for synergies, and that resonates well with Matt and me because we uh, have been talking about this uh, from a different perspective in terms of, you know, thinking about a mandate of having all the aerial vehicles flying out there collecting weather data, not just for their own sake, for safety of the operations, but also sharing that F information for the broader good. And similarly, there is other efforts out there that are collecting information that relates to whether that could also benefit aviation. So it could really be synergistic uh, in, in various ways. And ultimately, if you look at it from the bigger perspective, it could pay off and, and provide a return on investment for everybody. Absolutely. We have the National Highway Service that provides uh, valuable information uh, in, in almost every state, I, I believe actually in every state, uh, that demonstrates the conditions at the low level, at the road level, and why couldn't that be tapped into to utilize that information uh, for precipitation and um, weather information for low level operations. Yeah, and there are some operations, UAS operations, that uh, they built their aircraft with meteorological sensors in there for their own purpose so that they have a situational awareness of how they operate, what they are encountering, etc and they see the benefit for themselves. So I, I, I think there, there is a mutually beneficial synergy there uh, if, if it's advertised properly and there are options to engage and buy into this. Matt, uh, Matt has his hand up. Yes, yes, I saw that. Yeah, um, just to maybe address the, um, the issue with the lack of focus, I'm kind of paraphrasing what I understood the concerns to be with the data standardization and I, I agree it would be difficult to make any kind of policy or recommendation based on kind of theoretical future states of data so i recommend that, that or propose that that subject be about current issues you know existing issues with data standardization or sources of data that are um, available to the end user today that are not standardized um, to use an example of something that's close to my heart, you know, in situ turbulence reporting, there are a number of different methodologies, metrics that are deployed to the industry, you know, SkyPath from Yamasi, uh, TAPS, NCAR EDR, uh, many different presentations that are available in real time to the end user without any standardization. So not that it should be only about that, but to use real examples today where there are problems and not try to um, set the world on fire by correcting issues we may have in the future. Yep. Very good. Uh, and and by the way, for all the attendees, uh, and thank you, Tom Ryan, for reminding me. I I had I am recording this meeting. I'm also um, um, trying to take notes and eat lunch simultaneously, which means I'll have to go back and listen to what was said. So I'm I'm sure we will take advantage of that if they don't end up in in the notes that you see here being being uh, being put down. Um, we we will have these to go back to and listen to one more time um but I, and 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 i i you know i i can relate to what what matt Eckstein is saying about you know keeping it keeping it uh, closer to home maybe something that's going on right now 
I understand, you know, uh, Maryland's frustration on the UAS weather standards side and, you know, trying to get, try, try, trying, trying to understand how to, to hold operators to standards that are either unachievable or don't exist. That's a, that's a, that, those are difficult bars to work with. And yet that's what I, what, that, that's what I sense that, that, that Marilyn and her colleagues at Flight Standards are being asked to do right now in the UAS side of the world. Um, okay. Do you uh, move forward to the other slides with recent submission of standing to topics from previous sure. uh, discussions? So at least we have the overview of what has been submitted and where do we stand such that then we can start honing in on what will be priorities for spring or fall meetings. Okay. So um, let me just uh, blow this up a wee bit. Uh, so uh, these are um, topics that have been submitted uh, to the uh, to the FPA website uh, within the the last little bit, and so um, certainly we need to to take a look at these and 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 see uh, if if or how many of these resonate um, and um, um, should be should be. Uh, um, considered for inclusion in either the spring or fall meetings next year. Uh, so uh, Li Jang from IMSG submitted um, a suggestion that I think that Matthias has already um, uh, mentioned that um, that operational airspace capacity estimation prediction could be a, a topic of of some interest. And and uh, Lee, I saw that. Uh, that you unmuted just a second ago. Do you want to you want to just give a high level overview of, of what your thoughts are about this? Yes. Uh, uh, OK, so basically it's really it came from two things. Uh, one thing is last year I heard uh, some airlines talk about uh, the desire to have a. Uh, operational quantity that can indicate uh, certain airspace which is uh, uh, narrowed by uh, you know number of flights in the United States. I think probably from Southwest uh, Airlines, somebody at the airport meeting 2019. It, the other thing we did as a company is that we were funded by USTDA, US uh, Trade uh, and Development Agency under White House in 2017 to 2018 study the East China airspace uh, at that time, you know, before the COVID-19, there was a very uh, crowded uh, airspace, very busy, and we actually look into the details and, and think some of those are uh, near or surpass the uh, capacity of New York airspace. Very interesting. And also the challenge is uh, uh, they don't have a, like a, very free airspace like the United States. Uh, their control points are narrowly focusing on uh, routes and uh, trade count and something called waypoint. Uh, I'm not sure in the US we, we do we, whether we use waypoint as a, a mandate for a flight to go through. Uh, but we know that US, you know, we use airport uh, departure and uh, uh, arrival rate uh, updated every hour every, or every 15 minutes uh, at the, the FA uh, command center terminals. So managers will know the capacity. But before that, uh, any. Of course, we have uh, uh, a, a AFPs di uh, different. Uh, uh, traffic management initiative uh, implemented. Uh, but also it seems there is a benefit, of course, uh, if we can somehow quantify the uh, airspace uh, of interest uh, ahead of time or have a, a pre-playable scenarios. For instance, if we want to use the uh, reroute of uh, uh, by by using playbook routes, okay, uh, how about all of a sudden all the planned route will all go to the uh, the playbook route, would, would that cause additional congestion to the alternative to these alternative routes? So uh, intuitively, of course, it's going to be beneficial if we can 
forecast, if we use this kind of scenario, what is the, the uh, overall aerospace capacity look like uh, from you know technical scale to uh, strategic scale enabled by numerical you know forecasting capability? Okay, that's in, in a nutshell, a uh, high level overview. Thank you. Do you see this as emerging capabilities where we could have a broader look at this from various uh, research institutions? Because in the US we have several different uh, organizations that look at these kinds of things. Or do you see it as a specific update, informational update from your side only? Oh uh, no, I think it's it's a uh... Right now, it's sort of open. We uh, actually reviewed a number of institutional studies, and in doing the TDA-funded project, we teamed up with uh, uh, ESRL GSD, uh, the former GSD. Okay, and using basically using their algorithm to quantify the uh, constraint, then turn that into the capacity in terms of a number of aircrafts passing through points or sector or you know in route segment uh, in unit time okay uh, so in short you know of course a number of institutions can contribute to this you know uh, to to this endeavor uh, one one other thing is that we we saw from uh, indirectly from uh, ATM probably in Tokyo Japan okay it's, it's really on their screen they actually shows they're very precise, you know, precise meaning, you know, quantified to the single digit uh, percentage of the capacity today, you know, next hour going to be like 82% or 61%, th those kind of more refined uh, quantity for a sector. Okay, but in US, of course, we see that uh, for airport arrival and departure. This is this is Mike Robinson. I would say that we could put up totals in the U.S. for 61 percent too, but I wouldn't stand behind those predictions. Right, of course, there are. It, it's a a projection. There are uncertainties, of course. I'm I I'm sorry to do this to you, Anne Marie, but um, I, I'd love to put you on the spot here and and ask you for a reaction to this. Uh, kind of of work from an air traffic perspective, and if you don't feel comfortable answering, please just say Matt buzz off, and I will be happy to do so. Oh no! So I like to be very involved, and so I'm trying to follow everybody and and what's actually happening. And um, I, you know, some things, some of the acronyms, I'm trying to get used to because I, as an air traffic controller, you don't hear a lot of that stuff. But um, to me, the weather impacts everything that we do and and different facilities have different equipment and um i think um i think it's a a good suggestion that lee had uh i i don't know if i'm on the right track and if i'm making well, it so, so, uh, so i i wasn't i you know i was trying not to put words in your mouth but now i'm going to put a few <laughs> words in your mouth and see That's how it. that works go right ahead so so airspace capacity is a function of a number of things um, weather is one of those things. Um, staffing could be another one of those things. Equipment outages could be another one of those things, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, I'm, I, am, I am having spent as long in this work as I spent extraordinarily sensitive to what is in bounds and out of bounds for we meteorologists to talk about. <laughs> and and so um, so if we talk about operational airspace capacity estimation and prediction based on meteorological constraints, then that's then that's one topic. But one of the things we have to be extremely careful is that we don't say that. Okay, you know here here is the number. That's it. See you later. And uh, there's. In other words, there's more to it than just weather, and I'm reminded of that by the by the non meteorologist ATM folks all the time. Yes, and that's so, why that little box is there on the slide. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, and also uh, Matt and uh, uh, I totally agree. You know, especially concerning it, our experience working directly with uh, 
those uh, you know air traffic flow managers uh, in some of the units basically get a sense of uh, on one hand you know, they really when they have no help you know they really want to get some benchmark at least reference numbers. But on the other hand, if you tell them these numbers are useful but have uncertainty, so that's really where the uh, coordination, communication, human collaboration come to the picture. And that's really very, very important. But we see uh, by joining some of the telecom, the decision making sessions that uh, we uh, we did in East China, you know, uh, uh, a few years ago is that uh, we see air traffic managers after their discussion saying, you know, the, the, the inbound flight from Japan or Korea can come in only four flights per hour. OK, and then we ask what? Why do you have this four four flight per hour? Oh, safety. OK, of course, safety is is, is very important. But on the other hand, when we get offline, talk to airlines says, oh, they are very unhappy because it costs a whole, whole lot of delays. So the point is that it's Got to be a balance, you know. Of course, uh, uh, I think recently uh, Ernie uh, put together a review on the uh, on the uh, experience. Basically, concluded depend depending on who is the air traffic manager, their experience level and staffing level. Uh, every time you make this decision, the decision will be very different. Okay, so. I, I would suggest if this is going to be a topic, of course, I suggest include in the next fall's meeting, but also broaden it uh, because this is the first time we talk in depth about this. Uh, we, we really want to include not just the weather factor, but also the other you know, human factors right now uh, are not in the model consideration. I have to agree with everything he said. I mean, my last facility working in Potomac Tracon, which deals with Baltimore and Washington National and Dulles. It's it's the same thing. You know, there's pressure from the airlines to bring the aircraft in, even though there's weather there and they're saying you can only handle 25 airplanes to land at National. OK, and now the weather's moving in and the, the TMU at Potomac is saying we can't handle 25. We have to go down to 20 and then the airlines are saying, well, we're just going to give the uh, push the other five in there anyway and leave it up to the controllers to either vector or go around the weather. and. I, I agree that it's not the same everywhere. <laughs> the pressure's there and that, you know, everybody wants the safety aspect of it, but they also want to push the edge to make sure they can get everything out of it they can. Yes. That makes yes. any sense. Yes. Well, absolutely. It's, it's that, uh, it's that um, c capacity is a very perishable item. And, uh, and you know, putting my, my former airline hat back on, you know, we, we'd rather push more demand in there to take advantage of any capacity that we might not be accounting for. And 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 uh, as opposed to sit on the ground and then recognize after the fact that we could have landed three more airplanes, but they weren't in the air. So therefore, we couldn't land them. Yes. And, and the kind of that's what they do at Potomac. Sometimes they'll bring the airplanes to the edge of the airspace, hoping they can get that one or two more in there. And if they can't, then they end up holding the aircraft. Right, so they'd rather have maybe one or two or three or whatever the the number is outside, hoping that maybe sometimes the weather dissipates or it doesn't. That that's the stuff you can't plan on. You don't yep. know if it's going to build, dissipate, be broken up by the mountains. It could be anything. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, Nancy suggested something that is kind of related, but maybe from a somewhat uh, higher perspective before we go into the next two that are related to communication in the slide. Nancy was uh, suggesting that maybe we could have a day focused on today's problems in, of, in transportation, in air transportation, and maybe a day also focusing on anticipated problems with emerging modes of transportation. So, so where would you where would you put, you know, how how, how would you that with what we've just talked about? Would would this be a today's problem then, Matthias? Well, th this is probably yeah under today's problems in terms of the things we just talked about with making maximum use of existing capacity based on anticipated capacity, uh, etc. 
and and in some ways there is also a future there where you may have a much more varied entrance in the airspace and how to deal with that, for example. I don't know, Nancy, if you want to chime in and, and elaborate a little more on, on what you were thinking when you typed that in a chat room in case you have a chance between meetings. Nancy's multitasking like the rest of us. Maybe we just let it sit there and, and tackle the next two, which are both related to communication of information in, in various ways. Okay. And the first one is one that you haven't seen before, Matt, that came in <laughs> uh, through the FPA website. And by the way, please make use of the FPA website to submit topics anytime throughout the year. We, we collect them and pile them up, and that's part of the input into these planning meetings as to where we might take uh, uh, a discussion in, in the next meetings. So this one seems to be a very focused thing, focusing on uh, to what extent, and I'm freely interpreting here, to what extent you might be able to collect air, uh, weather data along your flight, but in order to save cam uh, communication costs that only once landed and have a, a better communication link at the gate that then you download that data and getting in into the system that way which obviously would eliminate the real-time aspect of making use of that information but it would still enable that information to be utilized in other ways to uh, validate uh, predictions of whatever uh, weather related aspects offline for the research community, etc. So I think that's where he was going with that. I don't know, Matt, if you interpret something else into this. No, no, I, I, I believe I believe based on the words that are here, my understanding parallels um, yours, Matthias. I, I'm 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 Thinking back to dark ages when when Delta was first getting its Medcars equipped aircraft up and running and and um, how I as a user um, of course wanted to see everything immediately so that I could if appropriate react to it or um, or or you know do do something with it now with the benefit of hindsight this is way back when I can tell you that that mostly the information that was received on the on on our side went um, under or unused, um, and so so the the idea of voting uh, from a datacom cost perspective um, is uh, um, is an attractive one, provided that the cost of of um, redoing the code uh, on the onboard systems is not greater you know than whatever whatever sort of a ROI period would be needed and that in fact Wi-Fi is available to do the downloading while parked at the gate and and certainly in today's day and age it seems like it should be must be but I'm not necessarily sure and I got I got to lean to Matt Eckstein again now to to ask you know are, are, are is it is it always there everywhere you go or is it not necessarily the case And Matt, I don't know if you if you heard me call you out. Well, you're, you're, asking, event, about, you're asking about Wi-Fi, is that right? Yes, is this Tim? Oh, hey, Tim. Yeah, it's Tim. And Hi, Tim. Uh, the answer is no, Wi-Fi is not always available. In fact, customers in the back of the airplane could have pilots and certain fleets do not have Wi-Fi up front. Yep. So, let alone uh, where Wi-Fi is uh, is or is not available around the world. So there are there are blank areas all over the place. It is not a seamless uh, system right now. Yeah. And I, I I mean I understand where Rich is coming from, which is you know I want to I want to get more more ubiquity to the Amdar slash Medcars data, and and you know maybe this would be a a way of doing it. 
Um, this is just a reaction. My reaction is that while this might help in the um, in the discussion or the debate, I, I don't. My personal opinion is that it's not a deal maker, deal breaker kind of thing. It's just one of several pieces that would have to fall into place for them. Yes, yes, uh, I agree that uh, it is one of the, it, but it is an important building block to uh, a seamless network and an integrated network. So, okay. And by the way, Tim, uh, I saw you. I saw you log in. Welcome. Glad to see you here. Well, uh, for the time that I can, I'm in between meetings. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, wanted to pop in and say hi. Thank you. Okay. Cool. So, do you want to go on to the uh, to the next one, Matthias? Sure, even though that actually came in through you because you had an exchange with Tom Fahey oh, oh. about that with the Legado Networks that got permission to build out a 5G L-band ground-based cellular network. And there are some concerns uh, that the signal may potentially disrupt GPS uh, devices, etc. And so there's clearly a, a meteorological component to it uh, that could be discussed. So I don't know if you and Tom had some more discussion besides that email exchange. No, no, so short answer is no, we did not, which is why, frankly, I had forgotten that we had even talked about this at, at the beginning. But interestingly, the last time I was out at uh, Boulder in your facility, um, uh, one of the topics that I believe was at least mentioned, if not covered in the in the PMR that was taking place out there, uh, was the impact of the 5G cellular network on um, on some of the satellite based um, water, if I remember correctly, water vapor um, um, measurement capabilities. And um, I remember sitting out in that courtyard, um, you know, at, at lunch speaking with a somebody from the weather service and I apologize I don't remember who it was but but who uh, who knew a whole whole bunch about it and and you know in so many words you know said here's the real deal and, and went through and explained it all uh, clearly uh, it was it, it was not simple enough for me to understand and or recall to this day but I'm wondering kind of out loud now if if as at least a topic, um, one one concerning the the effect of the buildup of the 5G network on met observation systems or navigation systems in this case would would be worth at least you know one of our shorter um, um, kind of briefing times. Yeah, I could see that this might be uh, of interest to a larger group. Okay. Good. The next topic has gotten some attention in the chat room in terms of pilot self-briefing. This was the Janet Ford submission from Capital, Capital uh, Meteorologics. And uh, uh, Gary Pocotna chimed in and Marilyn Pearson uh, chimed in. So I think there is some interest there in terms of how effective pilot self-briefings are and to what extent certain things can be automated there. Matthias, yes. may, I, may I plug Jim and Janet's work on a course that's going to be on the FAA safety team website. It's um, a really, really well done course. I think it's the first of three parts and this one is uh, geared toward the student slash GA and CFI uh, pilots and uh, they should really present it. It's extraordinary. They also were critical in assisting me with writing an AC titled Pilot's Guide to Self-Briefing, um, but I almost wish I had written it after I saw their course because their course is much better than my AC. <laughs> yeah. well, the, the AC actually influenced the course. And you know, I, I think um, this this topic, you know, is probably a, a broader, um, you know, look at how the FAA approached self briefing. And we we know that you know pilots use self briefing, but we also know that there were some challenges. Some of the research that Gary was doing 
um, you know, show that pilots didn't always understand what they were doing. They didn't remember, you know, what they saw in a briefing. So the FAA certainly wanted, you know, wanted to encourage self-briefing. But, you know, the process really started in an understanding what the challenges might be, both internally and externally. So we were thinking that, you know, this presentation might really um, cover kind of the journey, right? Like, in, in how does the FAA officially say, yes, self-briefings are okay? How do they address some of the safety challenges that, you know, were identified by Gary? Um, and, and some of the things that came out of this, right, were like the AC working with, you know, within, within the FAA, working with Maryland's team and, and others. Um, and then there was just, you know, other aspects around changing the FAA documents and handbooks that are out there because, you know, you could tell a pilot, hey, it's okay to do a self-briefing and they could come back or see if I could come back and say, yeah, but if you look at this handbook, if you look at the AIM, um, it says you have to call flight service. So there was a whole effort underway and then some of the fruits are starting to come out right now about like the AC being developed, the, the, you know, the websites being uh, cleaned up with their messaging. I don't know if anyone's looked at the the TFR, the SUA websites now, they used to say you got to call. Now they say you can use this for flight planning. So, um, you know, little by little things are happening, but there's some big milestones coming up here in the near future with the AC being published on how to do a self-briefing, uh, as well as Marilyn mentioned, the WINGS class. So well, we just thought it might be interesting to present this. Janet uh, took the initiative to, uh, you know, to put it out there. And, um, you know, we, we could kind of version of, you know, the history of the last two years of how FPAW was also even instrumental in, in giving us some good content. Gary? Uh, yeah, so I have a couple things to add to them. One, like I said, the WIDIC program, which I would try to include under this, we, we won't have a lot of results yet, but we could certainly present the planning on how we want to go about evaluating the effectiveness of self-briefings compared to having a um, specialist do it. That's one topic that I think fits well. And like I said, we've been working with them, so I think that would fit well on here. A second one, which I was going to float, that actually came a little out of this and may actually may be too detailed or complex for a Wittick, or not a Wittick, an FPOP presentation, but it's something we sort of noticed here and in some investigations and some talking with NTSB. And what that has to do with, we can't find much work or science from the meteorological community on decorrelation. So if you have an observation, say a METAR, and it's good at 10 miles, what we've seen in the self-briefing is pilots will look at a METAR and they see visibility at their takeoff point. Well, there's no real guidance or at their destination. They'll look at those. But the problem, a lot of the problems they're hitting are actually in route where they underestimate how bad the conditions are. And part of that is there isn't real good guidance if you're VFR at your destination and you're VFR at your takeoff, that doesn't mean you're VFR in route. And how far, once you move outside rated distance, that could be a helicopter flying in the Grand Canyon on a recreational tour for wind. You may have a wind station one mile away, but you're flying in an inlet in the canyon. Is that data good? And if not, how do you recognize it? How do you use it? How do you know when the information or an observation You've decorrelated due to distance, due to the type of weather, due to the terrain. There's really no guidance on that. You're sort of told this is what it's good at. And we've seen in some of our preliminary work, like latency, pilots just kind of use it because all they've got. And that ties back a little to something Maryland typed in there also, where some of this unofficial weather might be ways of tipping you off that the observation is no longer representative of where you're flying because obviously at some distance or some due to terrain and other factors, an observation is only valid for a certain area. After that, it's no longer representative of the area, but there's no real guidance on when to recognize that. You're just told that oh, this is good for 10 miles. Well, what if you don't have any other data and you're 50 miles away? Ah, I use the nearest neighbor. Well, we've seen in accidents a lot of times where the nearest neighbor isn't really accurate. And um, Matthias did some work for us that kind of had a little of this as well when we were looking at precipitous terrain, where the climatology and depending time of year, et cetera, was giving a better representation of where you were likely to encounter turbulence over a static um, representation of precipitous terrain. So it was the same thing. It's like the data mining and using other sources and prehistory to really determine what's your best source and how to convey that to pilots that the closest station may not necessarily be the best once you move out of its rated distance. So that's, 
I, I don't know quite how to put that as a topic, and I don't know if anybody's done any work in that area with all the meteorologists, if there's more, because it's something we'd like to learn a little more about what's being done in the Met community. I know there's a little bit with that, with the HEMS tool, with just using interpolation and extrapolations. Latency, people for most part, a lot of pilots just view it as real time because it's what shows up in the cockpit. Other guys think they know how to move it, you know, out of the latency in their own mind and they do a poor job of that. And we're starting to see some of that when you start talking decorrelation from the source. And that kind of fits in a little with this, but it's a lot more in depth and a lot more detailed topic. Yeah, I fully agree with you, Gary. And it, it is very location specific and what's going on at a particular location and time as to how representative a particular observation is. So, so but it is something we're coming in with. The other part that ties to this as well, which is what I said, the other thing I was going to suggest, and Matt Franzek, you may know, is a lot of this is also 2035 type work where it's starting to mine data a lot more. And that's a big push is that you've got now, you know, terabytes of everything. And that's what um, NCAR was doing on my um, precipitous terrain. And there's things you can pull out of data. And it might be interesting to present to FPA a little bit of the projects going on that are aligning with 2035 and having a very, very short summary of all these MITRE briefings to let the because as you probably know, Matt, if you followed, there isn't much weather in 2035 right now. The presentations are these high arching theoretical ideas and Bill Bauman keeps bringing up how weather right now hasn't been included. So to kind of talk a little about where to get ideas where that might fit, we might get a jump on that. Exactly. So, you know, Wittick, I got, I briefed at the PMR and Paul wants me to take, we have like three or four Wittick products, projects that are tied to 2035 type concepts and align with it. And he wanted me to take that up to all the managers. So I think that's something because next gen's kind of going away and 2035 is the next thing that, you know, that may be a place for FPA and all this meteorological expertise to jump in early and get some thoughts into that blueprint. You know, the problem, Gary, that 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 I have when you make a suggestion like that is it's, it's too damn good and it's awful damn hard too. It's hard. <laughs> Both of those are tricky. They're very they are. And the, well, you know, but on all honesty and sincerity, as you know, Wittick isn't the meteorological expertise. And when we look for stuff and you Mets fall short, we're kind of stuck. We don't do the, a lot of this. So I'm really hoping with a large Met community that I can learn something that flows over to Wittick because this, a lot of this stuff is too meteorological for the Wittick program. And um, so I'm floating it out there because I wanted, we couldn't find a lot being done on either. There's very, all I know we could find on decorrelation is that the effect occurs. As you move further away or the terrain, its accuracy or representative of that area goes down. Well, that's great, but there, we couldn't find any guidance on how much it degrades how you should use it, should you view it, what should pilots do with that. I couldn't find, we couldn't find anything in those areas. So I'm looking to the Mets, have you guys done anything? Is there work you could present that would help us? Is it an area that needs to be pushed up into the requirements through the COI as a, here's a gap and somebody needs to, you know, go out there and get people to start looking in these areas? And same with 2035, you know, We've got, like I said, we have four projects, I think, going on that Paul wanted me to brief to upper management to show how data mining can align with 2035 and what we're doing. But like I said, other people may have some other ideas to give a jump. And it also, I see Marilyn, this certainly ties to UAS. There, there's a large piece of this with representativeness and moving away from areas that typically fly where people are going to be looking at the nearest observations and those observations are not necessarily going to be at the rate of flight. So you're going to have a similar thing where you've got to have a better understanding of impacts that cause that observation to not be representative of where you are. So those were a couple inputs for me. They tie some part of that ties to pilot self briefing because you're getting it that way. And some of it are really some separate topics that you might want to consider. I don't know if anybody outside of NCAR really has a lot of expertise in these areas or not, and how much NCAR has even looked in these areas. 
Wish we had somebody from NCAR on our yeah I know. on our group. Should I mute myself? Yeah. <laughs> now, g getting back to this, I, I mean, th this topic is is terrific, and there has been research done to a certain degree, but it depends on what your interest is as to how you look at it, and it depends on who you are, what your your operation is, if you are a large aircraft or a small aircraft, uh, etc. So. Uh, it's definitely something that would be worth to do a literature review to find out what's out there and to what extent it applies for aviation or low level operations, uh, etc. And then what would need to be done uh, to go the next step and that in terms of synthesizing or whatever else to use observations in, in a smart way, whether that includes data mining or some other approaches uh, remains to be determined. But it really depends, again, re-emphasizing, it depends on the location and a particular time you're there that the meteorological conditions yeah. play a significant role into this. It definitely agree, but we've got it from some helicopter accidents we've been looking at. This has come into play. Um, and. Like I said, I could see where UAS would come in, but we haven't been doing that. But certainly we have some helicopter accidents that have come over from NTSB, as we've looked into, um, where these are issues. And like I said, for us, I, I can investigate them to a point, but there's also a point, it, it kind of flows out of what the Wittick area is, but it is Wittick because it's really what the pilot's doing with it. But I don't have a lot of knowledge on what the Mets are doing. Um, and it doesn't seem to be a well-researched area, except to say these effects occur, hey, be aware of them. And I haven't seen a lot be that, so. I, I fully agree with you. And I think that even from a meteorological perspective, it may not be simple to understand it. So yeah. you then go from a pilot's perspective who is not a meteorologist, how do you communicate that uncertainty and how to behave given a reading do you get from an, from a location? And that's where somebody else said decision makers and all. Obviously, you know my program, I was from a decision maker standpoint more than the MET, but there may be other people who want to jump on board from a MET perspective, but for ground users and for, you know, certainly ATC's got the same issue. You know, if they've got two points of observation and they got to tell somebody what they're going to hit in between, I'm not sure what they're doing with that information. Right. As well as, like I said, the pilots, we've definitely seen some issues with that on a number of the experiments. And we're going to pick some of that up in this self-briefing as well um, when we analyze that, because I think they run the same issues. Guys tend to look at these observations because they're the easiest things to understand. And we've seen, we saw an icing accident just recently um, that came out of NTSB. The takeoff was good. No icing. It was 60s. The landing areas were in the 60s but they were flying over altitude and um, it was just light icing. So it wasn't reported by a SIGMET or an AIRMET, but they hit light icing and eventually crashed. So, so um, l let me, let me kind of regurgitate what I think I've heard here and, and how it's sort of lining up in my, in my noggin. So the, the, the pilot self briefing um, idea that Janet Ford and Jim Hazeman and Marilyn Pearson and Gary Picodner have talked about there seems to be some uh, some amount of energy around that and and Gary has I think nicely and correctly linked to that this notion of decorrelation and and what what is the impact of it uh, both in the context of the pilot briefing, but but in additionally in the context of pilot decision making once uh, you know once the operation has begun, and and to to me those are are those fit very nicely with one another and could certainly be parts of the you know of the same session. The the 2035 leap for you for, for me, Gary, from you. I'm having a hard time linking that to that. That that almost feels that that feels very separate to me. And it is, hard. except that they are both involved heavily with data. That's really the link. Is it's a use of mining huge amounts of data to make determinations on what's if you're flying in an area, 
say in Southern California, you know, they're places where climatology tells you what's your best na- nearest neighbor. And that's a mining of huge amounts of data, which is a lot of what 2035 projects are looking at is this idea that you're going to have huge amounts of data being moved and can, what can you do with all this? What are the benefits? How can you make things better? And I think that's a prime example is that there is a lot of, if you use historical data and old data and track everything, you can figure out what gives you the best representation instead of just taking a single point reading of something that might not be the best spot because it's 30 miles and the other one's 60 miles. The 60 miles may be the better source. And right. climatology and data studies can tell you those things. Right. And that's a 2035 concept. Yeah. Yeah, but but it but it is. I would it's say it's not it the is, only one. Obviously. Right, right, that, and that's the point. It is a twenty thirty five concept. So we and could certainly maybe should be a separate one. But I think it would. It might be, and I'm floating it out there. It may be a good way to start getting Mets involved because, like I said, twenty thirty five outside of Whitick right now, there's very little being done, and I think very little elements being briefed. And I think Bill Bauman wouldn't mind starting to hear some inputs to 2035 weather related so if miter and some other people i don't think this is a wittick thing per se but it's it is something we could present some of these projects we're doing to show an alignment as one topic where we have we're doing these data things like i said ncar did one for us and we have a couple others as some examples it may get some other ideas spewed that then MITRE could take them and start folding them in as you start building down this high level 2035s that Paul's having you guys brief all the time now. I mean, you know, we're having a lot of those briefings. You probably had more of them than me. Yeah, there's been a bunch. <laughs> Bruce, I see you're patiently waiting. Your arm's got to be tired. Your hand's been up so long. Yeah, I just, uh, as I listened to this discussion, I can't help but believe that um, the uh, the best approach is to fall back on the notion of gridded data sets that uh, are produced based on all available uh, information that can be applied to, to the grid, um, including uh, various kinds of, of modeling uh, uh, infrastructure so that we don't ask the, the pilot or the user to look at a bunch of observations and try to make sense of them. Uh, we let the best of the science uh, go into the grids, which then we pr- uh, provide for the user uh, as, as, as the best meteorological information we can. Okay. Sorry, I'm I'm reading a message here. I and I, I can't multitask. I'm I'm reading something in the chat from from uh, from Nancy. Um, I, I, and I know Nancy, you're multitasking too, which astonishes me that you can uh, that you can type so much down here in the chat room. Is that is this something you're you're at a place where you can actually talk to it a little bit? Yeah, I, I, like I said, I think that some of the can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so some of the areas here have got, they're really complicated and there's a lot to unpack to be able to get a path to make make an impact or achieve a beneficial solution that, and maybe this is just a limited showing of what a session would be like, but it's it seems to me like we're just, it's kind of a, you know, picking a little bit here and a little bit there. But like I said, it kind of depends on what FPA is going at purpose-wise. I mean, if if you wanted to change the um, standard or the the um, policy around self briefings, then I would encourage a you know a whole session on it. Hey, here's here's the foundation. Here are the pros and the cons and the issues. And then okay, let's how do we how do we make this beneficial change and move forward what do we need to do to get there what's the research what's the coordination what are the efforts so it kind of depends on where fpa is positioning itself if it's an information exchange forum to get people talking together then i think it's the right way if you're looking to impact the industry and solutions i i haven't seen i haven't gone down to the slides to see how that um gets happens at each meeting so so I may be completely off base. No, no, no. Go ahead, Matthias. 
It, it, it depends on the meeting and the topic. I mean, in many ways, it may start out as an information exchange, and then you may dig deeper, and ultimately it could facilitate a significant change that affects operations than, you know, through regulatory changes or whatever else, procedural changes. So it really depends on the topics, and you will also notice that this is the planning meeting so we kick around different topics and sometimes we get into the weeds a little bit but it's also a matter of gaining understanding how much traction is there how much passion is there for this topic is this really a topic we want to raise and make a two three hours uh, of discussion shedding light then from various angles on this topic, which then can lead to a next step where we progress down the road. Matt, do you want to elaborate further on this? Well, I was just going to say that uh, that I was going to I was going to vigorously concur and and say to Nancy that if you look back far enough in FPA history, uh, it 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 came into being because a certain segment or segments of the aviation weather user community were were completely unhappy with how things were and so it's it 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 came into existence with an idea of doing something which was to fix what was seen as a problem or problems within the aviation weather world um since then it's been a mixture of of problem fixing and of um, uh, information exchanging among the various uh, constituencies who who make up the the FPA audience. That is the users, the producers, the researchers, the regulators uh, of aviation weather information. And and so so it, it's kind of both. Um, there is a there uh, there is a I, I think a kind of groundswell ish of support for the idea that we need to do something as opposed to just exchange information but uh, as, as we as we have learned over time um, you know one one uh, one does something at the appropriate times and then one tries to do information exchange at the other appropriate times and sometimes it's a hard place to to, to strike the right balance between the two just a side note along the history we started the FPA website only a few years ago. So if you look on the website on the past events, uh, you don't find the full record of past meetings and presentations. This is still work in process to, you know, move the archive onto the website. So that will eventually be there. So at this point, uh, you can't really dig for it easily. At least not there. You have to go back to the uh, to the old uh the, the old UCAR, uh, NCAR, um, um, uh, FPA folder and, and all the dirt lies in there. Oh no, I just pulled up all of Rhonda's emails. <laughs> <laughs> that's good too. But no, that's, that's fair. I, like I said, I just, I'm, I kind of gravitate towards the p moving past admiring the problem and let's work on solving the problem because I think it's a better use of of time but i yeah I, i'm also have no objections to sitting around the you know the beer in the evening trying to solve world hunger type of conversations either i just like to know what i'm signing up for yeah so so matthias uh, i just uh, just a uh, you know let's let's let me take a step back and say that um that that um i heard a a um, a, a some amount of of interest in in uh, Lee's uh, airspace capacity estimation prediction proposal, uh, probably enough to to find a group of people to talk about it and to to present about it. Um, I'm I'm not sure on Rich Mamrosh's whether there was um, whether there was a whole lot of energy behind it. I I personally find the 5G network question interesting but it, it it certainly doesn't seem to me to be the stuff of a you know major major portion of the day session it, it seems to me more like a hey by the way that here's an update on on this 
for those of you who have not been uh, been been paying attention. I heard a lot more energy around the whole pilot self briefing uh, morphed into the decorrelation uh, question, and and um, I think this actually fits in very nicely with um, with with some things that uh, that uh, that that I've been involved in, that Marilyn Pearson has been involved in reference um, reference uh, both manned and unmanned pilot certification uh, uh, qualifications or or things they have to know um, uh, it, it, it's it's a, it's a pretty nice fit in on on multiple levels so it seems like there's a there there um, and then I'm I'm intrigued with with Gary's 2035 suggestion uh, and at the same time I'm terribly frightened by it. Um, because it, it feels like this would fall to me to make this happen. And I, that, that scares the pants off of me at this point in time. I mean, you can put it on the list and it may be something we hold off for a while. But I think at some point this would be a good venue to help get weather in on that. Maybe it's the, maybe it's the fall meeting. Maybe it's further out than that. Yeah, and dang it, I don't I don't disagree with you, Gary, and that's my issue. <laughs> no, I know it's tricky, and I know I don't know at what point it makes sense, but I also know within the FAA that is what's gaining traction, and to certainly start and get all the folks who were in on this talking about it earlier, I think earlier versus being on the back end might provide more benefit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, NASA and FAA are working on the 2035, and NASA's working on a 2045. I wonder if it's worth getting an FAA rep as part of that group and then reaching back to the FPAWS to help provide inputs. Sounds like a reasonable uh, suggestion to me. Again, it's a, a, this. I, I I agree with everything that Gary has said, unfortunately, and 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 so so you know I or or Mike Robinson or somebody like that will have to reach back into the hallowed halls of MITRE, for instance, and say we want to we want to put together a session on twenty on 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 the FAA's twenty thirty five vision. We know that that MITRE is playing a role, NASA is playing a role, FAA certainly is a is you know the key player in this. We'll, we'll need to we'll need to gather a, you know a, a a handful of individuals and 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 talk about how we want to approach this. And 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 I think it's a I think it's a you know as far as getting people a little bit energized over what's next, uh, over what sort of things should we be thinking about from an R and D perspective, from an operating perspective. I I think it's a um, a, a a wonderful place. To go um, and and dang it, Gary. Okay, I'll, I'll stop now. <laughs> I, I think this is also leading in nicely on what's on the next slide that we talked about uh, previously as a potential topic for for a future FPA meeting. And at the time, we were thinking of an in-person meeting in Washington DC and that is really looking across the federal agencies in terms of what is going on in the various agencies from a aviation and weather perspective and what triggered me really again how useful that was at the fall meeting a couple of weeks ago Bill Bauman gave an overview of the weather a community of interest and that really highlighted within the FAA where the different weather pieces reside and it's amazing how uh, distributed that is and how the FAA is trying to create this community to to facilitate at least within the agency this dialogue related to weather and aviation and if we were to get an overview of a similar nature from various federal agencies as to what is going on within a particular agency whether it's the air force or nasa or navy or whatever uh, there are pockets in there that relate to weather and not just weather but specifically weather related to aviation and it would be nice to get an overview of each agency to 
see that and connect the dots. And as part of that, we could talk about what are the current problems that you're trying to solve or the problems of a decade or two down the road that you're trying to solve and facilitate connections here that may really recognize, oh, there are similar efforts going on in different agencies. And if we leverage that and collaborate, we actually may solve something more effectively. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing the slide that Matthias is referring to that Bill briefed uh, a couple of weeks ago. I've, I've seen it a number of times now in, in various um, uh, fora. And, and, uh, uh, and, and Bill, Bill, right up front, if he were here, would, I believe, say, and by the way, this isn't all. This was, this was one kind of quick pass through the organization to think about who and what is is involved in weather, and there's there's probably much more that that we don't have depicted here. Uh, notice that uh, that Anne Marie's organization is here, the AJVS, and she's an AJVP. So now there's another box that needs to come hanging off of here, which is one more uh, one more section of 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 the mission support group. Uh, so there there's. I I agree, Matthias. I I think I think is is this one where 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 you do one and then you and then at the next at the at the fall meeting you do the other and and if so and by the other i mean that you know gary's 2035 suggestion and if so which one which one goes in what order in your opinion in my opinion you need to get that overview first because then you have a framework where you can start seeing how these things fall into place when somebody brings up, this is the problem we're trying to solve. Oh, there you see where they're coming from and, and where they're sitting in terms of why this is a problem they're trying to solve. Okay. And if you think about this, this is a major effort even within the agencies. I mean, it was not just that Bill Bauman had this in his drawer and pulled it out of his hat or whatever. This took effort to just trying to find those pockets and structurally organize them in a way to get this overview. Yeah. So if other agencies would entertain a, an effort like that, we would have to find out who is the right person or who are the right people to to get this going within the agency to carve out a an organizational structure or a, a network essentially of where those different pieces are. And once this is clear, then we can go the next step and say, OK, let's talk about what are your issues and where are you going? What, what are you working on? So okay. this is not a, a two hour uh, meeting. This is probably could be the entire uh, uh, spring meeting, three days of different agencies reporting potentially on what they're working on. And what else do we have there? There are a few more bullets that are maybe not as fleshed out there. Uh, but there were clearly uh, the state, the future of forecasting science and the benefits to decisions. There was weather observations all the way from ground to space. Public private partnerships facilitating new entrants and uh, the weather standards. I think that came up earlier in terms of uh, that topic. So we have plenty of things we could talk about, but I'm also looking at the time here and wonder if a 10 minute break or so might be beneficial and then come back and think in terms of, OK, what are the major themes that we would like to address in the spring meeting and the fall meeting and start filling in the blanks of the next two slides, essentially? Yeah, yeah. Um, th that that works okay for me, Matthias. Um, ten more minutes, like last time. Is that is that sufficient? I think so. Okay, so I'm showing more or less thirteen thirty Eastern, seventeen thirty Z. Let's uh, come on back at thirteen forty Eastern or seventeen forty Z or whatever time zone you use. Ha, 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 ha.
<laughs> you know, it was getting a little fresh out there. Yeah, yeah. I noticed that you were just kind of talking more slowly. <laughs> Glad you got to go inside and, and, and thaw a little bit. Yeah, Mary finished her uh, conversation there, and then she went for a walk, and that opened the door for me again. There you go. <laughs> There you go. All right, I got the. Uh, I have. Um, I have the. We're at time to start back up. Boy, we got all kinds of great suggestions. We need to have more FPA meetings. We have too many topics. <laughs> all right, um, Matthias, how would you like to proceed? I I think we should recap the significant topics that kind of based on a discussion surfaced and then uh, see how people feel about them, maybe based on raising their hands or something like that to get a sense of, and I wouldn't go through all the discussions that we had in, in the last you know couple of hours or an hour and a half, but based on where we see there was enough interest in it or also based on where we feel like it would be important to nudge things to. Are we going to say in this? Sure. <laughs> cool. <laughs> OK. Um, so. Um, so so I, I have I'm sharing again our uh, newly submitted topics list. And then I have our, right on the next slide, I have our um, previously considered topics, one of which we already um, uh, have, have just talked about at, at some length in, in relation to um, a, a, uh, a newly submitted uh, topic, which is not here, uh, which is the one that Gary submitted reference, the, the NAST 2035 um, Area. So, um, so how do you want how do you want to work it, Matthias? I mean, you. So, so do we want to do we want to like like, you know, do um, well. Well, so before we hand raise, let's 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 talk for a minute about about structure and and uh, the implications of and I'm talking meeting structure and specifically virtual meeting structure. So, so this last go around, we did three days. We did basically a major topic each day that consumed um, anywhere from two and a half to three hours of time, give or take, and then a, a an additional topic which consumed anywhere from one to one and a half, well, a half hour to an hour and a half's worth of time. Again, depending on exactly what it was that, that we were talking about. Um, so, so for the spring meeting, I think that, um, and and let me go back to this slide. So, uh, so uh, we had written down, you know, general meeting format, two or three days question mark. The the thinking here, if I if I recall correctly, Matthias was, you know, what if we don't have material for three days, then then there's no sense in having you know three virtual half days. We'd have two virtual half days at that. Um, but by the same token, it feels like three half days is equivalent to what we have um, had our in-person meetings with the, the day and a half back to back to back uh, in, in person. Um, and and that, that, that seems to be a, a nice amount in terms of the balance between, um, uh, you know, uh, ha having time to talk about at some length some interesting topics. Um, and and not being at it so long that by the end of the time your your head is empty and you've got no no cognitive resources left. So um, so it feels to me like again two or if we have enough material, which I believe we have in spades, three days is 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 the right amount of time. So now we're talking about um, th three major topics and then perhaps three partial or minor topics to make up each 
one each in in each of the three days as 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 a way to approach it, not the way, but it's it's certainly the way we did it last time. Um, I know that that Tom Ryan has already on the chat chimed in and said, I'd like to do a an update of previous topics like we did at the last FPA meeting. And in addition to the ones that that uh, that we covered last time, which probably still should should get a few minutes to give an update because they are ongoing efforts. I think that there are some additional ones that we should bring up, such as what Josh uh, presented this last go around about some of the winter weather and icing stuff. And uh, to me, to me, Tom Ryan's suggest suggestion uh, seemed um, very reasonable. So, so there's one of our shorter sessions. Um, the spring meeting is typically where the, um, the the uh, the uh, aviation uh, weather user consortium um, led by Tim Miner has done its announcement and went in person presentation of of um, um, the the weather prize and if appropriate the service awards. Um, Tim, I don't know if you're still on. Sorry, let me let me see if I can tell. Should be able to tell. So Tim is not here, therefore I I I do not know um, if if they have in mind to, to to do that again in the spring as they had been doing it or in the fall, um, but but it could be a spring um, a a spring session. So we'd have to leave a little bit of time for them. Um, I think Matthias uh, that that you know we have enough sort of interesting. Um, uh, FPA administrative slash organizational conversations going on right now that that we should at least leave a little bit of time to update what if any progress we've made in in those areas and so um, so at that point you know we 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 have our our short sessions <clears throat> covered and we and we basically are looking to for the spring fill the three bigger time slots, correct? Uh, more or less, yeah, I agree. The, the difference is uh, if we do on on the shorter updates, like one was Bill Bauman with the FAs where the community of interest, but yep. if we were to do an, an agency review, then that might be wrapped into this. So it wouldn't need to be one of the sh smaller updates because it would already be represented in, in a different level. Sure. And along the agency review, that depends a little bit of how many agency we can sign up to participate and look through their whole organization as to where are the different pieces and get that organized to, to make it an informative uh, uh part of the discussion and also bring up what you know maybe their major topics of research what they are concerned about etc so if we really have multiple agencies lined up in order to have some substance there this could easily take more than one day it could eat up two days possibly all three days if i mean it could be really a major effort to to cover that because we have many agencies there and once you start digging you find interesting pieces in there that may be relevant to this community yeah steve dar has his hand up yes sir steve thanks matt um i just wanted to observe that the the spring meeting this year was supposed to have that federal agency review and I'm not sure how mature the planning got before we went virtual and, and took it off the agenda, but is that <clears throat> something that's at least partially canned and able to be revived? I think we didn't quite get as far as we wanted to and seeing the Bill Bauman presentation on the weather community of interest really put a little bit of a different spin on it that we would like to really engage the agencies at a deeper level to 
convey what's going on inside the agencies than how far uh, the session lead has been able to take it. So I, I think it will take more work to really pull this off in, in a way that at least Matt and I are envisioning this to look yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. and, and I, I would say, Steve, that, uh, that, that while, the, while the two um, will probably share these, a, a similar title or a, a, a similar topic area, I think, I think what, what we maybe are thinking about in terms of what would be and how it would be presented are, are slightly different than maybe our original thoughts were. Let me, before I go back on mute, advocate to to doing um, a federal agency review of for <clears throat> weather activities because so many of the topics we've talked about, bringing in data that's currently not certified for weather, bringing in um, you know observations in areas where we don't have them, or trying to figure out what observations we do have would correlate better you know, from a geographic perspective, et cetera, really would depend on accessing non-aviation or non-traditional aviation kinds of, of information that other agencies might be producing. I, I, I hear you loud and clear and agree 101,000%. Randy, you got your hand up. Yeah, th this is a, a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, and it's something I've I've actually wanted to do for for a while. My comments are: this is too big for FPA for a, an FPA session or or an FPA <laughs> uh, week or whatever. I do, however, think this would be a great one-off as a separate conference workshop, whatever you want to call it. Um, maybe in the summer or next fall or something like that, because I really think this is going to take some planning to, to get everybody involved. I'd actually like to see this done in person as opposed to virtually, um, but maybe it was something that FPAW could sponsor as, well, as that one-off. Uh, but I, but I don't think that it, table? Say that again? Sponsor in terms of putting money on the table? No, I mean as far as trying to put everything together, not no, not 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 funding. I yeah, I don't mean to say that you need to fund it, um, <laughs> but but yeah, I mean as you know, as far as you know, hosting it at a location that we could maybe get for free, like um, you know, some in car facilities or or maybe the NTSB conference room you know, someplace like that and, and then host it um, and help put it together, I think, I think would be feasible. But to try to do it as, as FPAW in the spring, um, you're right. I think it's just too big. It would take up, uh, I mean, this is easily a two or three day. I, I fully thing. agree. And I also would love to do it in person. And that's what we were talking initially. And that was part of the reason of canceling it at the spring meeting because we had to go virtual and we felt like the benefit of in person is is uh, really important and the, and the yeah and, and the thing is just because it's you know across federal agencies um aopa and a4a and and all these other groups and and individuals are going to be extremely interested in in this as well at least from an attendance standpoint uh, agreed, and the travel aspect comes then with the in-person versus the virtual. Virtually, you can more easily get people to dial in, right. but you may just dial in for their segment and then they're gone again. And in that sense, you don't get the, the interaction going that is really the beneficial part of, of this. And given that many agencies are headquartered in DC, it would make sense to host this somewhere in the DC area, whether that's at the NTSB in their conference facilities, or I'm volunteering MITRE here, and I, I can see how, how Matt uh, is, is nodding, because MITRE has also interesting facilities, mm -hmm. and it's easily reachable on the train within you know half an hour. 
I don't know to what extent the agencies would consider this travel and make it more complicated already just by being there. <laughs> but uh, I, I could definitely see it. I don't think it's realistic to look at this in the spring in person. Nope. It's too soon, given the pandemic situation. Even the summer may be questionable. The fall may be more realistic. Yeah, I could, I could, I could see this as possibly a September type thing. End of fiscal year. Yeah. Well, especially if well, I'm not talking you know last week of September, but uh, <laughs> but but yeah, because because then you know beginning of October is just as bad as the end of September. I, I fully agree with you. But in some ways, while I can see a standalone meeting brings some benefits, I see also there's a lot of effort going into this. And if we make it in the fall, I would do that instead of the fall FPA meeting and say this is our event. Uh, this is just selfish being, you know, and I'm speaking probably on behalf of Matt too, that uh, we spend a lot of time on shepherding FPA. We, we are on the call with each other on a weekly basis, talking at least for an hour about things. And if you want to do this right, there is clearly extra hours going into this and then making it a third meeting that we are organizing besides everything else that's going on. I, if we want to do it in the fall, I would then do that instead of the fall FPA meeting or say this is the equivalent of our FPA meeting. What do you think, Matt? That's just me talking here right now. So, yeah, so I, I, um, I, you saw me give thumbs up to the, the, the facility um, uh, volunteering um, and, and you know, th that, that would be fine. The, the Robinsonian part of me says, oh, we can do this in F part two. The, the Franzakian part of me says, you're out of your mind, dude, if you think you can do both of those, you know, in the, in the, same, uh, in, in the same season. Um, with, with that having been said, the other thing that, that is, is, frankly, I've been looking, I've been looking for um, the, the, the reason to, or, or the opportunity to make a stronger connection between FPA and ARAM, and maybe this is it. May, maybe this is an, a, an ARAM special symposium that is co-sponsored by an FPA and an AMS ARAM and uses the facilities of the AMS to help the meeting come off and something like that. You just open a can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to say it that way. I, I fully appreciate AMS and what they're doing, but if you do it under the AMS umbrella, then there will be registration. There will be registration fees, and, and it becomes a whole different level of management that goes into this than if we keep it as an FPA meeting. I didn't think about the cost aspect of things. It didn't even cross my mind. I just That's figured it would be like typical F-Pod, be free. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing free in AMS. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, but but fundamentally, I I, I agree with you, um, Matthias. And and the you know the, the the dilemma in my head is that is that you know in order for for instance the NAS 2035 discussion to be fully relevant, we need to have this discussion ahead of it, as I think you pointed out before the break. And and I don't want to I don't want to push it off anymore too. So um, so so let, let me ask you this, Randy. Um, you know you've I, I think expressed concern that 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 a a federal review could not could not. Um, be done well in in an FPA meeting, given how much time is available in an FPA meeting um, to do stuff. I know we were planning in person to to quote devote the whole FPA meeting, which is basically the equivalent of three half days um, to it, and it still had some of our other ancillary 
sort of, of, of you know, updates and whatnot planned to go on around it? Is it, is it your thinking that it would require e even more than that and that we would have been selling it short if we tried to do it in the spring in person at a typical in-person FPAW meeting? Um, well, I think I think it would be at least two full days, maybe closer to three, um, because there's a lot of stuff going on on the Air Force side, the Navy side, the NASA side. Um, that you know, even even on the uh, the DOE side, that has aviation applications and implications. So I I, I think there's you know plenty of opportunity to to get every to to fill three full days mm -hmm. um you know, could it be done in the spring and could it be done virtually yeah I and mean, i don't think we can do it in person in the spring this coming spring i just don't think that's that's going to be an option um the reason i would prefer to do it in person is a lot of the, you know, we, we've never really had all these agencies together and getting everybody in the same room, I think would, you know, the sidebars opportunities would be really incredible there. And I think we'd miss that if we had everybody on, you know, just doing it virtually. Um, you know, I, I happen to know a lot of the Air Force folks. I know some of the Navy folks. But there's a lot of people who don't know them. I don't know anybody from FEMA. Um, and and to do it online, I think we'd miss that opportunity to to do those kind of introductions and get to getting to know each other and and you know potentially working collaborations after that. So that that's why I'd really push to do this one in person. Okay. Do do you want to Matt want to get a sentiment of how people? that are on right now would feel about uh, doing a three day in person uh, meeting in the DC area in the fall? Sure, so if, if you feel like that is a good idea, please raise your hand. The count is going up. It's certainly the majority of the people on the call right now. Yeah, it looks like it's uh, 14, 15 uh, out of 22 that are on the call right now. So I would say we would call that a majority. Thank you. If you will all lower your hand, I appreciate that. Matthias, again, you know, we're, we're as we as we are want to do, we're doing this on the fly. Um, um, you know, we, we, we have we have uh, expressed um, or, or heard expressed the perceived importance of doing this in person, which with, with which I agree. Um, so so um, and 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 Washington in the fall plus FPA to your point, Matthias, is probably more than than um, than 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 I can handle, or that MITRE will be pleased to have me handle at that point, and and so, yes, I agree. It would have to it would have to replace the fall meeting, which means for for a Heather Reeves, um, you know, we we would we would probably with gratitude and respect ask her if we could push off um, uh, Nissel until fall of 22 or something like that. And, but that, that's just a, a detail for us to to um, go ahead, Randy. I was going to say, ba based on the weather going on in Oklahoma City this week, I don't think that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, and I'd be on the planning for 300 plus people is kind of. I think if you pull all these folks together, and even if you opened it up to the local government, state and local governments. You know, you could be looking at an exceptionally sized gathering. Yeah. Well, um, so um, I, I know a nice 400 or so person auditorium in McLean, Virginia, that's an easy walk up from the um, the metro and that has uh, virtual meeting capabilities and spades. And 
whose lords and masters proclaim that they like to do stuff like this. So, um, so I guess I'm volunteering miter if it comes down to that. Lee, I see you have your hand up, sir. And you'll need to unmute. Li Jang, you're up or not. <laughs> okay. Maybe that was a leftover from the vote. The vote. <laughs> um, so, so I'm 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 okay with that. I'm okay with proposing it and and with you know with starting to um, to to make preparations for that. It um, I have to watch out for the uh, the turbulence impact mitigation workshop, which will be occurring in early September, <laughs> at that same auditorium in McLean. Now. Along those lines, Randy, do you have some sentiments of how this is coming along or not? Is that really in Tammy's court or are you engaged in that too in terms of conflict potential there? Well, as far as the uh, turbulence thing, um, I think I think she's planning. Is she planning that for early September? Yes, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll give I, you I, I think that would be OK. If we if we push this off into October. Um, I, I think I think we'd be okay with that. September first and second. There you go. That's probably even better because now you're that that's before or even Labor Day. So yeah, yeah, that should be okay. So then you would see the agency review in October. Did I hear you right? And the turbulence workshop stays early September, and in that sense, it kind of is separated out. Yep. Okay. Good. So if we do that, we would need some folks from uh, some folks who have connections to be on the organizing group to help shepherd this this agency review. I think. Randy, you would be a ideal candidate. Can we volunteer you to help? <laughs> um, instead of you volunteering me, how about if I volunteer myself? <laughs> Great, thank you, Randy. Appreciate that. Uh, because you hit multiple agencies, uh, it, it this really helps. I mean, we need to make yeah, sure. I I have I have lots of friends in low places I can, I can get to. <laughs> and I also think the OFCM or however it's being called after their reorganization, there is probably a lot of information there in terms of contacts that we can tap into, etc. Uh, so if we get a few people together to just start kicking around and collecting contacts and thinking about how we're going to shape this, then uh, I think there will be a good chance we can pull this off by the fall. Federal or government? I will probably start at the federal level. I, I would kind of, yeah, my, my initial thought was keeping it at the federal level because if we, but, my my issue is if we go state level now we start to get into um, and I, and I think there's a there's a place there for them but if we start going to the state level now we start talking about UAS and UAV work and and that could be another three days by itself so I I'd, I'd almost prefer to to keep the state government out of it if we can I mean there's plenty at the federal level anyway. Um, but uh, you know, it's something we can take a look at, and if we find that there's a hole there that we need to, that needs filling, or if it's just we can't get around it and we need state participation, we can certainly look into it. So I, I guess that kind of uh, will drive a lot of the attendance. If Smalls or Smalls and AAM or UAM is out, I mean that's a different flavor. If, you know, if you're just talking transport aircraft classes then you're going to have a different attendance than if you're really going to get into some of these areas where, right. where weather yeah, and is that, okay. and that may And that may be something that, uh, that you know, this this group that we put together needs to discuss, because 
that may be too big and complicated to try to answer right now. But, but to get back to you, Nancy, on, on your point, I mean, NASA is heavily engaged in the advanced air mobility. So that's part of the agency effort. And similar is the FAA. So I think we still capture a, a good flavor of that in, in this review, even without going to, to state or, or other levels. That, that's true, but I think you were seeing a lion's share of the funding that's, that's supporting the efforts are coming from the state and local level. I mean, I, NASA's funding in this area is, is minuscule compared to what those folks are spending, you know, dealing with local weather issues. So I think you're, you, would, you would turn off a lot of the users if they couldn't come in and say, hey, I want to set up a system in Winston-Salem um, because Na NASA's not going to be interested in that. I mean, we don't have the funds to do that. So, and I don't think the FAA really does either, but I may be speaking out of turn. Maybe this is a discussion to have with the key stakeholders who help shepherd this this uh, symposium to understand, you know, how deep can we realistically go? Because if we go too deep, then you suddenly start talking. This is more than 300 people. This could be a thousand people. Yeah, I mean, kind of what's your what's your purpose? What's the purpose of is it? Like I said, is it an education purpose? Is it to to get something done purpose? And and that kind of drives at, at this point, I doing? think it is to a large extent an education purpose and getting people connected, seeing what's all out there, what's going on, and then it can grow from there. And Randy, please chime in if if you see it differently here. No, I, yeah, I was I was I was about to say I I, was, I look at this at least initially as an as an education type thing, finding out, you know, what what kind of work is, you know, the Air Force or the Navy doing as far as um, you know research into aviation weather. Um, the same with uh, with NASA, but it's I I certainly see that um, just about everybody we talk to is going to say, oh yeah, we're doing this this this, and and then on the UAS side, we're doing this this and this or we really have a shortfall in this area and we'd like to discuss that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think we're, and it's, and it's no different than anything else. We're just gonna have to, you know, we can discuss everything, but eventually we're gonna have to put bounds and limits on the, uh, on the topics and things like that. Um, and you know, maybe, maybe do a session or a half day on a uh, on UAS support, um, but who knows? It, it let's uh, let's take a look at it and kind of see what falls out once we start talking with the other agencies and um, seeing what their interests and and desires would be. So so Nancy, as the uh, as the sole NASA representative on this call. Um, could could we rope you into uh, helping out with this? Sure, if you don't mind me being opinionated. <laughs> uh, well, we you all know, if there were a bunch of wallflowers on this call, I might have some issues. But nah, <laughs> come on, join the crowd. The water's warm. And only if Randy sends me his FAA organization slide. <laughs> We're getting ready. To, we're getting ready to start up a weather subgroup within the RTTs, and I need to know who's all who all we should talk to. Oh, I can I I can dump Kevin Johnston on that one. Oh, he, he, he too late. He's there. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nancy, are you looking? Are you looking for something similar to what we showed earlier that Bill Bauman presented at the previous? Uh, at last, at two weeks ago's FPA. Yeah, so the one with the FAA org chart. You can go on the FPA website, and I believe it's there already. Okay, I looked. I looked. Maybe it's just because I haven't gotten my membership confirmation yet. No, you can look even if you're a if you're a non-member. And if you, and if you can't 
If you can't get it, I'll send it to you. Yeah, or I will too. But but yeah, it, I looked. I didn't see an obvious under. Re, I guess it would be under resources. I didn't see an obvious place for it, so I miss, I missed it. Events. Yeah. Think um, past events. Yeah, go go to events, okay. and then past events, and then the FPA meeting from two weeks ago, and then under presentations is Bill Bauman Weather Community of Interest. Perfect. And Matt, I have a couple other potential POCs in mind, but I, I'll need to talk with them before I, you know, well, throw them, them under the bus. Because <laughs> they're because they're not really affiliated with FPAW, but they uh, they should be willing to help. Randy, we just started engaging with DOT from the NASA side, but you guys are more closely related with them. Did you want I me? Mean, I can poke them and see, or did you want to do that one? Um, who who you who do you converse with on the DOT? Bob Sheehan. I. Uh, over in the sec was assistant secretary for administration, joint program office. No, the yeah you can you can go through through him then. We uh, we we kind of lost our, uh, our our DOT rep when uh, Paul Pisano retired. But Paul mm -hmm. could still be useful to point us to the right people. Yeah, and I and I've I've got the contact information for the person who's over there now. I just can't think of them, their name off the top of my head. Okay. So, um, so we're 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 doing great work at planning the fall session. But we have <laughs> a great session to do first. Yeah, yeah I'll <laughs> I'll shut up now so you can go back to the spring session. <laughs> okay, well now now that this particular turn of events has occurred, <laughs> um, what are we doing with this guy here? So how, how would you like to um, how would you like to approach this, Matthias? I, I let me just say that that this topic, um, combined with with Gary's input, sounded like um, you know it, it sounded like it was um, components of one of the fuller days, um, and and it sounded like there was a fair amount of of enthusiasm around it. Uh. Yes, I, I'm not entirely sure whether the pilot briefing, what the, the courses that's available and, and the ACM and other things we talked about, whether that's an informal uh, session that just shares what's going on, or if there is actually a discussion that needs to happen about this. And I see Chan had just raised her, her hand and maybe uh, she can chime in. Please. Hi, um, yes, I wanted to just chime in and just kind of piggyback on what uh, Marilyn and um, Jim Hazeman stated. Um, the overall purpose for the course is really to help um, pilots bridge the weather gap, their weather knowledge gap that currently exists between um, with pilots. Um, as, a, as a former uh, flight service uh, person, um, Pilots have over the years, as you all are aware, are were accustomed to the specialists providing the information and they writing it down. Um, but as far as being able to interpolate, understand, and practically apply that um, information themselves, um, that's where the gap is. And so the course is designed to assist pilots as we transition to as they transition to utilizing more online resources to not only just know that the products are there and available, but how to util effectively utilize those products um, when they are doing their pre-planning during and also during flight. So the course is really is designed to bridge that gap and to move the pilot into a more knowledgeable um, area so they have a better understanding and are able to better interpret weather and then make more enhanced decisions or better decisions um, for pre-flight and also also during in-flight. Um, so the course is um, designed right now, the first course is for 
um, student slant VFR pilots. Um, that's the course that right now we have a draft and um, will be the first wing course. We'll have a we we're working. We will begin working on a second one for IFR and then also for high altitude as well. And then we'll tailor it based on on obviously the pilot's experiences. So that's what that's that's actually what it is. And um, so we would definitely be able to present um, and within the allotted time that's allowed, but it, it, it fits in. I believe that it will fit nicely into your overall objective. OK, and I see Gary Pocartner was just typing something in the chat room related to that, I believe. Gary, you want to chime in here? Sure, I was just saying mine would be a little less than or not just informational. You know, our Emory Riddle team is more human factors than a lot of Mets. And the, hopefully by the spring session, they will have a plan put together on what we want to look at to evaluate um, the effectiveness of both a voice briefing compared to a self briefing. And obviously, flight services, Janet's team will be giving us input. But I think getting METs to look at it and make sure the products we're replicating, the ones we're using, obviously, we can't check every scenario. I think FPAW could be a good place for us to give an overview of what we're doing to make sure we're choosing good scenarios and the right information to use to really test which is more effective. So mine would be kind of getting inputs from the group um, not necessarily driving anything except for the plan. It's not going to be, you know, government policy per se, but we certainly could get some inputs to make it a better experiment and make sure we're not missing something from a meteorological standpoint. So, so Gary, are you are you suggesting, uh, or or in so many words, um, um, well, suggesting is a, is a good term, I suppose. That 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 you know, you would make a presentation and then ask for feedback from FPA, which would in turn stand up some sort of a special group or a tiger team or whatever to uh, of volunteers to to look at this and provide this feedback back to you from from the Met perspective. It could be that, or they could do it during the meeting. You know, it depends how in depth. We don't have a plan yet; they're just starting. But depending on the complexity. I would hope I could present it in a manner that people will interactively, as we're speaking, have ideas, but certainly people could follow up afterwards. But I would try to present it in a manner of the scenarios and the um, weather elements that we were including and see if people think we've chosen the right things and give opinions on what we might be missing. So right. I would see it more as an interactive session than Tiger Teams. I don't think it's that involved, but certainly if people have an expertise and want to do, give us more input afterwards. We certainly always accept people on the working groups who have hours to do it and want to collaborate with us. But I would think at the meeting, I would hope I could do a presentation where I could have, make it an interactive, I guess is what I'm saying. Got it. Got, OK, I, I, I didn't I didn't fully understand your, yeah. your your comment in the chat. Now I do. Thank you. And then I would take them back, obviously, and we would update our planning based on good inputs. Well, that, if there is one thing that virtual meetings um, um, can be good for, as you are aware, it's doing exactly what you're talking about, uh, whether it's polling, whether it's uh, right. whether it's, you know, choose A, B, C or D and, you know, that that sort and of thing. And it's the right community because I have Janet's team there at that time who can also hear those ideas. So I think it's a good opportunity for Wittick to get free help. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like this nicely complements what Janet was talking about, uh, about the course, the training, etc. What else does need to be added to it, or are these the two pieces that are needed? Well, is there is a whole other piece, Matt, Matthew, that um, she doesn't cover. Hers is focused on the pilot, and I don't know whether Marilyn, I haven't read all her standard, but the other thing that's really lacking out there, which our experiment has to include as well, is there's a myriad of structures for self-briefing products. So a lot of vendors for flight, other people set up their own and there isn't a huge amount of guidance yet. And I know Marilyn's working on some of that 
But what does a self-briefing have to look like? What does it have to have? What is the order? Sort of like what you guys did with Mobile Matt. There's a, you know, everybody writes their own apps. Some work well, some are horrible. And we've kind of seen a little bit of the same thing with some of the support tools out there to quote do a self-briefing. Some are complete and some aren't. So as we put together our own as we're doing this, getting inputs on that as well is are we picking the right structure as we replicate a self-briefing that covers the strengths and weaknesses of what's out there? So we'll need those kind of inputs as well. And I think attendees, there will be attendees that will know that. Janet? Um, I was just going to piggyback on what Gary said that, and I think Marilyn had to go to another meeting, yep. but, but the new AC that is supposed to be coming out, um, hopefully it'll be out by the spring, um, is going to focus exactly on that as far as how, what resources are available for a pilot if they are going to do self briefings, utilizing online resources. And it kind of, the AC is going to a touch on, on how to do that. Um, so it, it's going to be a really good guide for the pilots to use. And hopefully if it's out by then, um, Maryland going through that AC would definitely add value to um, this particular uh, topic as well. And I totally agree. The hitch we have and with what she said is Maryland, the until it's released, it's under somewhat tight control. So I can't right. use it even for Emory Riddle yet. So uh, Maryland wasn't able to commit to a release date. So if it's ready and it's out there, that'll certainly be a big aid for us. And I think would also be something that would fit in with this, that she could present some of those details and kind of give an overview of that circular um, to help with it. But if it's not released, um, then we're sort of, we can't, there's only so much we can utilize it. I mean, I can read it, but she doesn't want it spread out until it's official, which I understand. So it's of limited use until it's actually a release day C. Okay. Well, regardless, to me, it sounds like whether it's C as an underpinning or with a high level description of what is likely to come out in the AC uh, that, that, you know, there can be some tie back to it. And it sounds to me like you've got basically three presentations, which based on, you know, on how we, how we normally try to really hard to save room for discussion and save room for interaction basically fills up one of our larger sessions. Uh, and and it sounds like instead of it being called pilot self briefing, I really like Janet, when you when you talked about uh, about like filling the pilot weather knowledge gap or or something along those lines in the context of uh, of uh, of what has traditionally been a a pilot briefing process. So Matt, do you want to go to the spring page and start jotting down those thoughts? And I wonder whether we can have Gary, Janet, and maybe Marilyn as session leads for for this the, the preparing shaping this topic i hear no, nothing I, I hear nothing back <laughs> yeah i was thinking the same thing i mean i'm, I'm certainly I'm, happy I'm, to work I'm, with janet and jim i mean that i have no issue working with them um I don't know if you want three leads, you can do that, or you can put, you know, Janet's name and have Jim, me, and Marilyn as sub leads. However, you like doing it. Well, well so, so right. let, let me let me let me just chime in here and say that that in Matt's perfect world, uh, which I don't live in, but if I did live in it, in Matt's perfect world, um, th there would be more than one person because invariably this becomes um, um, a, a fair amount of. It is, it is good to have multiple. Uh, mm -hmm. multiple points of contact involved in, in doing some of that cat herding, but it's also good to have kind of a single belly button to identify as the POC or the session lead. Matthias, what's your opinion about that? I agree with you that uh, as we, you know, work our way towards the spring meeting, we will have bi-weekly meeting where we, and Gary, you know that, uh, that we will touch base and mm -hmm 
make sure that these sessions come together in a good way and not always everybody can make it. So having at, at least two people or three for a particular topic that helps. Sure. And like I said, I don't call, care whether you call me a co-lead, a sub-lead. I'm happy to do that. I, th I think we'll split it. I was just, it's um, because I think the start of this falls, you know, Janet's my customer in this case. So as an overarching, I think the way this is going, flight services is the true lead. So if you wanted to put her name as number one, me as number two, and we're co-leads, and then Marilyn, I probably wouldn't mind being a number three as a, three lead, however you want to call us. You can call it triple co or a <laughs> senior and it might doesn't matter. I mean, what's in the name for FPA? It really doesn't matter, but you can put our three names on there, I would think. Okay, that sounds like a good plan because you, however you want to refer to us. We don't um, have I, titles. <laughs> you can right. just put Janet's name first that way, you know, however. That, that, that's what I'm <laughs> looking for. Can. I want to know whose name is on top. Um, I, I would also like to have, um, so Jim um, Hazeman and I have been, well, we're all part of the same capital group. So um, basically Jim and Janet. <laughs> so we would definitely uh, be working together. Okay. Uh, so so would you like to be on the same line? Yeah, just put, yeah. <laughs> we would, that would be great because we come as a team. <laughs> okay. You're like John Stevenson, Gordy Rother, and... Um, there you go. Stacey, you're, you're, you're yeah. triplets separated at birth or something like that. Thank you. Good. Okay, so that would be day one. Okay. Something like that, and and, and th those are just those are just words, and we can we can make them turn them into whatever we want to turn them into. But at least we'll have half a clue at what we're talking about there. Okay, and, and whether it's day one, day two, day three, yeah, whatever yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the day. Okay, all right. Back to it. Let's see where are we. Where did we have other significant discussions that sort of floated up? So what? I'm, so um, I I don't I, I don't want to um, I I don't want to unilaterally you know promote or or demote any other of the ones of these. But um, but whereas this generated a lot of discussion, the other three generated less. And and so uh, you know my my reaction is that that you know while interesting maybe there's not the the full support of that on the other hand um lee's um lee's suggestion uh, or or um uh submission here um is a is certainly a very interesting one and one that is going to end up being i think well it, it's extremely important today but it will be even more important in a full trajectory based operations 2035 NAS environment where we're needing to know the capacity and how to how to tactically adjust it is a key tenet of TVO. I guess by bringing that up, what I'm kind of wondering out loud is if this one isn't best tied to matched up with that NAS 2035 discussion and if so, does it then, by definition, come after the the federal slash state agency review? I don't know if John Kozak, you raised your hand. You want to say something related to this? Kind of uh, something I think along the lines of uh, Matt's initial thought there with regards to um, some things uh, generating more conversation than others. Um, you guys can hear me okay? Yep. Sorry. Uh, so my thought with that would be, um, you know, we might want to make some of this tentative since we only have, uh, what is it? Um, sorry, 20, 20 people currently in the meeting. Um, maybe a, an opportunity for other people to comment on this stuff. 
after you, you've gone through it tentatively uh, to see what you guys like and see what uh, you're interested in um, for the greater community. Just, just a thought. Had, had you guys thought about doing that at all? I mean, because I know there's some other people that are on probably the uh, same meeting that I'm on and maybe had other stuff that they had to do today. Yeah, and 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 John, you're you're, you're you, as as mentioned, it, it was unfortunately um, a confluence of a bunch of yeah. meetings, and therefore, people that we would normally expect to see here aren't here. Um, but just food for thought, as far as is is not you know walking away from this with a concrete plan today, so much as a we really like this. Does anybody have any significant issues with it? Just a thought. Yep. Well, I, I'd like uh, my main goal in life is in the next 25 minutes um, to, to have these these other two main topic areas at least filled in with something that is our 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 first attempt at uh, identifying a topic and 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 points of contact. And um, um, so I'm 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 that, that's that's. That's where that's where I would like to uh, to rapidly get to in the next 25 minutes. You brought up the talking about the standards work that the ASTM is doing. Um, I know we just did one. We did an overview of it at the AEWG, but maybe it's a, a, a dive in or deeper dive. Kind of what research do they need to finish their work or something along at least a different slant on here's kind of basically what it is. Right, and that goes in the direction also of weather observations that are maybe non-traditional sources or so, and to what extent they can be utilized. I mean, this can be a pretty broad topic. So, so are we uh, now? Sorry, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm back looking at general topics. So, so basically, it it falls in this. Kind of category, correct, Matthias? But of the of the non-traditional sort. Yes, I think you have notes below your slide. Oh, there. radio. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, I did. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, there, there's certainly in the, in the in the unmanned area and and in even in the manned area but but uh, you know where where in the data sparse areas there's certainly a lot of energy around um around this particular topic and and we already know that Walter Combs could fill up an hour easily by himself as could probably Gordy fill up an hour easily by himself talking about this so i i don't think we would lack for um for input Steve Dar, I see you with your hand up. I was going to uh, speak to Lee's idea, but uh, since the topic has shifted for a moment, let me <clears throat> talk to this idea. I do think it would be useful to have, you know, a major topic for the spring meeting be um, the non-traditional weather source stuff. We've talked around that uh, quite a bit. You know, three or so years ago, we had State of Colorado advocating. Uh, pretty um, significantly in that area, and and unfortunately they haven't been coming the last year and a half or so. But um, but I think there is a lot of energy, especially related to um, small UAS and and UAM and AAM, and um, and so I would suggest we make um, that a primary topic, uh, and then. Uh, Hearing no objections, I'll, I'll I'll change the topic to what I would raise my hand about, which was to say that you know within FPAL we've talked a lot about trying to um, get at what benefit do we provide and and you know why should people care about us, uh, and I think Lee's idea um, for a topic, if if we could demonstrate an ability to. Um, more readily integrate weather into capacity limiting decision making 
um, and and how that might happen. And I, I think it's still a pretty nascent topic uh, in terms of solid con ops for it. But um, but if if you know if if FPA could facilitate a discussion around uh, around that, you know, it, it really touches everybody: the airlines, the NBAA operations, and you know the the um, command center commits a lot of energy to trying to manage, um, and and I agree weather is nominal, but I'll, I'll still say off nominal weather days. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think that could be useful. And if we're, um, it, it, I could see it being something we come back to regularly over time, but being also something that we can look back on in four or five years to say, Hey, we may have had an impact here. And when you say weather here, you mean all weather or specifically convective weather? Because there's winter weather, there's hurricanes, there's all sorts of stuff. I mean, this could go pretty broad. Or, well, I think I think initially we would want to focus on things that we uh, that we can maybe get our you know, get some um, initial results from. So if Lee has got research that he's able to to provide that says, you know, when we see a radar echo covering 40% of a sector, we all see that sector dropping by, you know, 60% of capacity or, or you know, it, it, the idea of, of having data to look back at and um, and trying to use that to inform, um, you know, a forward look certainly isn't new. I mean, the idea of regression regression analysis is is predates all of us. But um, but I think there's you know some opportunities around big data that you know Gary has spoken to and and probably exist in this area where. Um, you know, there may be able to be uh, some some ideas for how do we how do we uh, use that information to to you know look forward in the future to say this is what we see coming from a forecast perspective or this is what we see in a nowcast way and. Um, and where we would expect capacity to be within the um, the on route sectors, for instance, or the or the um, you know from the corner posts out for terminal areas. So, if I hear right, could then this topic, the major topic, be like big data or use of big data? for estimating capacity and predicting what we may see happening and how that is being utilized for managing uh, air traffic, et cetera. Yeah, I think it should turn toward an operational focus, but I see Lee raised his hand, so I'm going to stop putting words in his mouth and ask him to <laughs> speak up. Okay. I'm okay. glad he raised his hand because if he didn't, thank I would call him up. Uh, thank you for the comments. Uh, and also, uh, actually, when I, when I drafted this uh, yesterday, submitted to online, I, I missed some words. It's really, in my initial thought, the focus on convective weather. Okay, just like Matthias pointed out, if we broaden too much, there will be too many things uh, we want to solve at one time. Uh, not realistic. Uh, but also, I, I, I kind of think I can reach out to Mike Robinson at MITRE. I think uh, they have some group doing this similar kind of some kind of research R&D development on capacity issue. Also, uh, Ernie Stallings uh, from NBA recently write up a, a report that included the several institutes, like including uh, us and uh, MIT Lincoln Lab on relevant uh, studies uh, on how to fundamentally how to model the airsp airspace and within that modeling framework and what are the constraints and and also issues brought up by whether to consider or how to consider accounting for human workload. Uh, it's going to be there. There are many areas to, you know, that this topic will, will link to, of course, uh, but how do we narrow it down to a session that can be 
can be done within a couple hours or half day. That that's a uh, uh, I think that's what we're driving towards today, right, Matt? Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you know, I, I mean, I, I like this topic, and I think it's relevant, and and um, it it's going to be some serious cat herding because it will want to get bigger faster than than you know maybe we're talking about being able to put in a two to three hour uh, period of time over one day. Um, um, so, so in that respect, it, it, uh, it, it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a daunting, uh, but interesting topic. Um, I, I, I know Lee that there are folks at MITRE who have worked on this from both the human perspective and from the modeling airspace capacity perspective in the, in the face of, of, of for instance, convective constraints or, or hazardous turbulence or, or icing or things of that nature. So, so. Yes, I'm sure there's some folks at MITRE that that can that can help contribute um, to the discussion. Um, uh, Matt Wandishin, you uh, you sent me a a, a direct uh, mail earlier. Um, do, do you have anything to add to this? And would you see yourself being part of this conversation? I would be happy to contribute if such a session were to uh, were to take place. Sure. <laughs> Very well. <laughs> well, what do you think, gang? Is this uh, is this a, a second major session in the spring? How about we show hands? Say yay, verily. Seems like we're getting there. That's it. OK, so <laughs> I need points of contact uh, to put in my little list here. And I also need to know uh, whose name to put first. By the way, this is this th this will go down here. Shall I call this? Uh, and this does not mean that that this is number three. This is just the third one that I put in here. Does do I call this? Um, 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 the, using big data to uh, to um, uh, to to estimate airspace capacity or something like that. Uh, Lee again. I kind of think we keep a uh, big data out of the topic. Okay, because big big data, of course, is important. It's it's, uh, it's a tool. It's something that we can we can rely on when we get to the technical approach. But as a topic, uh, uh, it's really trying to for for operational community to think whether it's worthwhile to have operational capability. You know, especially given right right now we have you know we're we're migrating at NSEP, we're migrating to next generation global forecast system. We already operation, operationalized F3-based uh, GFS, unified GFS. We have GOES-R generation, you know, GOES West, East, much higher resolution capability. All these contribute to big data, of course, you know, but the uh, uh, the driver behind it is really the operational needs. Okay. I just grabbed your word. Well, I grabbed the words that we had up here uh, for for your piece, Lee. I, I'm not sure that these are your words, but if they're close enough, what do you think about that? And and if so, do, so do these words more or less work for you, Lee? Yeah, these are the 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 main words, of course. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Very well. Now, and I we need... save these as we move forward and make it, you know, more specific as needed. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, who who all can can we uh, can, who all would have an interest in 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 being a point of contact slash session co lead for this particular session besides Lee because because 
You know, Lee, once you once you propose it, you're in. Okay. <laughs> L E, please. <laughs> yeah, I knew that. I okay. was just testing. The uh, the other one I'm I'm thinking maybe put a question mark also is uh, Ernie Stellings. And uh, of course, I can also reach out to Mike Robinson to see whether he's he's interested in it is available. Well, you well you know that Mike is interested. The question is, is Mike available? Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> reach out for that. Uh, what, what about what about Matt Wandishan? Yeah, of course, no problem. I just don't know enough of Matt's uh, background. Yeah. And also, I'm really thinking about, you know, traditionally we uh, we have MITRE and but uh, I'm thinking really probably NASA is doing something too, you know, uh, in terms of developing new new tools or relevant to next gen aerospace capacity. Uh, I saw one person, Nancy from NASA right now. Oh, there's the all kinds of people with their hands up, even on my. Oh, no, maybe that's a voting hand. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not sure whether we, we need to broaden a little bit uh, at this point. Of course, we can finalize uh, later. I think uh, Anne-Marie Dajo was also saying, uh, please pull me in if if uh, you need help in this regard. She was engaged in that because discussion we had earlier today. So maybe it might be worth uh, adding her there. That's because great. Clearly put the operational perspective on it. Mm -hmm. And also can reach out to Greg Bias at the uh, FA Command Center that uh, who, who is actually managing the uh, air traffic flow management program. OK, so so um, so so Lee has said yay verily, and then we have a bunch of of, of other people who may be voluntold or tiered. OK. All right. Um, let's go back to this topic number two that I I put in here, and then we went on. Is is uh, is this then the 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 one that I have listed as number two, the third of our three topics? I think that sounds like a good topic. It's a matter of who do we list as our contact. Precisely. <laughs> It might be good to have somebody with like a okay. <laughs> okay. Um so um so I, I know this is a loaded and a half question, but Steve Dar, is this something that you'd be willing to try to 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 be at least one of the cat herders on? Uh put two question marks behind my name. I'll have to check with the Yeah, I know. I I know I I and that's why I said it's a loaded question because I know what you have to do. Yep. Um I I I don't know if Nancy's still on, but maybe Nancy Mendonca, um given her advocacy in this area, would be willing to work uh work on that. I'd almost rather throw um, one of the folks from the ASTM under the bus. They've got nice. the three weather groups in there. <laughs> so spit out a name, Nancy. Yeah, yeah. Give me a belly. I'm just gonna throw. I'm just gonna throw Tom Birchoff under the bus. Sorry. <laughs> I was thinking of him too, and I'm sure he would love to do this. <laughs> I'm going to put a question. Question mark means they're not here to defend themselves. Yeah, I would I would do one thing. I mean, I think we talk about a lot of things in a lot of different forums, and it would be nice to kind of build on each other's work. I mean, I know we just did a, a, a CIWG meeting that we recorded and put up on our um, NARI's website that, you know, Don was at, Marilyn was at, um, and, you know, Robbie Hood, and I forget. I forget the gentleman from the FAA who's leading the other the other group, but to give people a hey here's the way here's the link for the foundation we're going to continue from this point in the conversation on vice rehash 
you know, stuff that people have already presented. Yep. Sorry, I'm just, I'm thinking and I'm typing as I'm thinking. I know with what Walter is doing that, um, that, that, um, you know, it, it, uh, normally Tom Ryan would include him in his update, but if we had Walter, you know, kind of updating and briefing on his VWAS work, that might be, a, a, again, another non-traditional weather observation source and, and, you know, maybe go in nicely there. Another person who I know is, has been, um, who has been kind of wrangling with Marilyn about, um, you know, about, um, we're thinking about purchasing these things. Will you, will you qualify? Will you recognize them as a qualified weather source? And Marilyn, of course, is forced to say, how can I? I don't have, you know, I don't know what standards exactly to use, but another person might be, um, oh, Dang it. Uh, Justin from UPS Flight Forward. I can't think of his last name now. Earlier. Thank you. So that's just some, some thoughts about uh, maybe some names. The, the only problem I have with this one right here right now is that is that all these people have question marks by their names. And I... <laughs> I, I need one of them to be a to be a solid one here. Don't don't you think, Matthias? Before we continue forward, uh, I, it would be nice to have one, but I think we can follow up, and I'm sure we get some of them to agree to to help with this. Okay. All right. So so in our remaining three or four minutes, um, a secondary. Um, um, you know, one of our sub sessions will be Tom Ryan and the ongoing FPOT topics review. And Tom, your your um, your material may may uh, morph depending on how much of it is presented during the main topics here. But that'd be a good thing if it morphed into something little. Yeah, I support putting Walter in that second topic, so I get it. Oh, and you know what? I, I mean. You know, here I'm sorry, I'm I'm thinking out loud. Yeah. They're not here to defend themselves, but I know they have they have dogs in this fight. Okay. I have Marilyn on all of them, even though as much as she loves the weather part, uh, you don't want to burden a single person too too much. No, I, I know, I know. I mean, yeah, maybe maybe we do it this way. Yeah. Okay. Um Another one of you our could put uh, you could put Matt Wandeshan in in there, given his comment in the chat about providing an evaluation of the camera based visibility estimates above in the oh, non traditional oh, weather. Oh, Matt, can I put you in there? Yeah, that's fine. Sorry, I'm always too slow to hit the unmute button. <laughs> You're too slow. I just fail to half the time and people see my lips moving and nothing coming out. Okay. Um, cool. And um, one, one secondary thing. I know you're looking for a couple of other secondary topics that we've um, all been waiting for, for you know, from the spring meeting anyway. Um, is the new um, weather handbook from the FAA, Aviation Weather. Um, AC or whatever they're, they're publishing that we know we don't have a, a solid date on yet, but hopefully by the spring it's out. So this is the thing that, that Marilyn is working on or? or the John Steventon owns it. Okay. Is, is that part of a topic review that could be on the Tom Ryan's group? Or is it a larger thing? I think we talked about it for this the spring meeting earlier this year as, as having its own hour. Um, you know, yeah. enough time to, to sort of brief that it's available and what the differences are. I'll let you know up front that John's probably going to say, man, it's in it's in legal. I have no idea when it's coming out. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, 
uh, it's it's a good project though. It's a very good project. I had the honor of helping them with it. So. so maybe that's a question mark in there too. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's there's th there it is, and and again, primary and secondary pairs um, are are completely arbitrary at this point. But but there's three primary, three secondaries. Um, uh, Tim Miner's not here to say, yay, verily, we want to do something in the spring or in the fall. Uh, but, you know, Tim typically doesn't take much time. And if it does look like the fall is a possibility of an in-person meeting, I, I, I feel confident he'll want to do it then. Um, so so I, I don't think it's it's unreasonable to um, to have it kind of filled out like this. What do you think, Matthias? I think we are in a pretty good place to uh, follow up with people individually afterwards to figure out do we have actually leads or people signed up for the sessions yep. that we're planning here or sketched here for the spring meeting and also then for the fall meeting with the agency review. So yep. we have a lot of follow up to do, but I think we're in a pretty good place right now looking forward. Okay. All right, so uh, for, for Janet and Jim, whose uh, name appears on top, um, um, we'll consider you guys the dynamic filling the pilot briefing weather gap duo, and, and you get to rope Gary and Marilyn into submission. Uh, Lee, um, um, if, if you want our assistance in reaching out to individuals to help you with your session, whether it be, you know, me and Mike Robinson, uh, uh, you know, to, to look in, inside MITRE or, um, uh, or, or to reach out, you know, perhaps to, to, to any of the others in here, please, please feel free to reach out. And then, then Steve, if if, uh, if you're given the green light to uh, to be the chief cat herder and bottle washer, that would be great. And you've done this before, so we won't have to tell you much. Thomas Hoff has his hand raised. I don't know whether that's a remaining hand or a comment that uh, we should hear. Tom Hoff, if you're if you're looking to speak, please speak. I suspect that was a leftover from the vote. Okay, it's a few minutes past three, which means that um, despite my best efforts to make sure that we're really late, we're, we're not all that late, actually. We are pretty good on time. Yeah, yeah. Thank cool. you all for contributing to this discussion to shape the upcoming FPA meetings. Really appreciate that. Thank good. you. Thank you. All right, all. Uh, good day. Take care. And uh, we'll be reaching out to some of you in the not too distant future. Thank, Thank you. you all. Bye. 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 Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye.